Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming to this 151, uh, 151st plus of the 50th anniversary ceremony for Tsukuba University. And I'll be serving as the MC today. My name is Shinji Takeda. And also, I will be serving as the moderator. My name is Yuko Aoyama. So Mr. Takeda and myself both used to work at NHK. And at the end of February this year, I believe that you retired from NHK and you have this morning program called Day Day on Nippon Television. And you graduated from Tsukuba University before coming into NHK. And I knew that. And I was really shocked when I learned that you will be leaving NHK. Well, actually, you left NHK much earlier than myself. Both of us are from Tsukuba University, and we are both retirees from NHK. And today, um, we are here as moderators, and we have a lot of people who are alumnus of uh, Tsukuba. So in 1990, I graduated from Tsukuba University. Over 33 years, I have been working at NHK, and I left NHK at the end of February this year. And you um, have been working as a free um, news um, man, woman. Well, yes, actually, after I gave birth to my child, I have been work, living in Hong Kong for a while, uh, but I came back to Japan this summer, and I'm very happy that I, I am able to see all of you here in this hall and this ceremony. So we are celebrating the 50th anniversary uh, since the establishment of the University of Tsukuba. And uh, we do hope to make this a memorable uh, ceremony. And of course, uh, the ceremony will start from 1 p.m. But until then, uh, we would like to have you enjoy uh, Hitachi no no, which is the student song of Tsukuba University. We have Yo uh, Yoichi um, Uchiai, a uh, professor of media art, uh, has uh, provided us some media art. And the song uh, was made in 1976 by Katsuhiko Aoki, who was a student here at the university. And the Oh, that's the, uh, actually he made the lyrics, and the song itself was made by Mutsuko Ijima. Uh, and then um, this was edited by Yoshi Tomo Suzuki. Uh, the orchestra of the university uh, will be performing this, uh, and also the chorus of Tsukuba University will be singing the song. So please, uh, uh, the conductor is Takuto Komatsu. So please enjoy.
には涙という考え方ですので非常にこの明白になってきたんですねところが光が波であるとすれば一体何の波だとそれは音の波ではなく時の振動ですね光はそれじゃ何の振動かという波を伝えるそのメディアムです媒体これが何,何だか知らないけどそういうものがなければ波は起こらないだろうというのでその媒体としてエーテルというものが考えられていたわけですでところがこの光っていうのは真空中も通りますしあるいは透明な物体であればその中も通るこういう物体の中も通るんですねですからエーテルというのはですね真空の中にも存在するわけで真空を満たしてるんですねですから通常の普通の物質とは違うということは考えなくちゃいけないそれからこういう水とかガラスこの中にもエーテルが存在してるから縮,縮むとあるいは周期が伸びるなんていうことは全然考えていないわけですね長さはいつでも動いていても止まっても変わらないそれから物の周期が動いても止まっても変わらないというそういう立脚立脚点つまりこの真空宇宙空間は真空じゃなくてそこにエーテルがいっぱいになっているとするとならばですねこのエーテルの海の中にじっとしているものが動いているそのエーテルの海の中でエーテルに対して動いているものその間で何か違ったことが現れるのではないかというそういう問題です。レーテルというのは普通の物質と違って例えば東京駅なんてのと違ってですねあらゆるものの中にこの満ちているものであるわけですからありますけどとにかくレーテルというものがあるならレーテルに対して動いているとかレーテルに対して違っているとか動いて止まっているとかそういうふうに運動というものを考えることが2つに分けることができる。っていますかエーテルに対して非常に速く走っているもの、遅く走っているもの、止まっているもの、それにいろいろ分けたこと、分けることができるわけです。その時にですね、エーテルに対して止まっている世界ですね、の中と、エーテルに対して動いている世界の中で、果たして同じ物理法則が成り立っているか、まあ、その中に住んでいる人から見てですね、同じ物理法則が成り立っているかどうかということが、えー、一つの問題になるわけです。どういうわけでそういう問題を考えなくちゃいけないかという説明をもう一度ここで分子と新幹線に登場を願って考えてみることにいたしますでこのつまりエーテルに対してじっとしてるそういうこの車ですねそれとエーテルに対して動いてる車と考えますでこの時あのはですねエーテルってものは宇宙全体にこうなっているものだとすればエーテルに対する運動とエーテルに対して止まっているとかエーテルに対して動いているとかいうことの意味がですね統計的に対して止まっているとか統計的に対して。was a wonderful performance. Thank you very much. So, Tsukuba, University of Tsukuba, 
and also the Education Institute uh, before that, uh, has spun out a lot of great people in the world of knowledge. So before the song of Hitachi no no, the song, I believe uh, the voice that we heard was uh, Jigoro Kano, the headmaster way back then. So it's 151 years since the inception of this university, and that's why we're holding this ceremony today. So 151 years, what, what does this mean? Well, uh, the origin of the University of Tsukuba uh, goes back to 1872, 151 years ago. The Meiji government created the normal school back then, and the University of Tsukuba was opened on October 1st of 1973. So tomorrow we will be marking the 50th anniversary. So the 150 years and also the 50 year anniversary. That's what we are celebrating today. Now the Tsukuba campus is about 60 kilometers uh, northeast from the Tokyo, the central Tokyo. It was called Nihari-gun, but now it's called Tsukuba City. It is right in the middle of the Tsukuba Science City. Uh, this is where we have a lot of research institutes concerning material as well as high energy uh, accelerators. About 150 research institutes gather here in the city. So it's not just Scuba uh, University. We have a campus in Tokyo uh, where uh, working adults come together and we also have facilities in Yatsugatake and Shimoda, and there are 11 affiliated schools uh, that has also turned out many alumni. And so this is a celebration for the affiliated schools as well. So over the 151 years, including uh, the predecessors of the University of Tsukuba, we have Dr. Shinichiro Tomonaga, uh, who was the president of the University of uh, education, um, Tokyo University of Education, and also Leona Esaki, Dr. Leona Esaki, uh, fr a former president of Tsukuba, and also Hideki Shirakawa, also um, a honorary um, professor of the University of Tsukuba. And also we have uh, Yos Dr. Yoshiyuki Sankai, famous for the robot suit, and also Masashi Yanagisawa, um, who was known for his sleep research. And also in the field of sports, judo, um, gymnastics, volleyball, swimming, um, including those from the affiliated schools, all together in the Olympic and Paralympics, 41 golds, 44 silvers, and 48 bronze medals uh, have been um, awarded to graduates from the schools. So uh, Nobel laureates and Olympians and Pal Paralympians uh, have been uh, have come out of this university. And so we have a lot of athletes uh, during the FIFA World Cup last year, I believe you all know, in Qatar, Kaoru Mitoma was quite active and on the pitch, and also Shogo Taniguchi is another alumni, alumnus. And on NHK, the great drama, the year-long drama, Idaten, if you remember, um, featured Shiso Kanakuri, uh, who was the first marathon runner um, from Japan. And he is actually from Kumamoto, which is my hometown. And he actually attended the Tokyo Higher Normal School. And back then, the headmaster of the school was the person who established judo as we know it today is Jigoro Kano. Um, he was the headmaster for more than 23 years, and he accepted many international students back then. So Tsukuba University, since its opening, has been a university open to the world, uh, fostering internationalization and interdisciplinarity. So um, it has been opening the doors to the world since its opening. So we will be ha uh, starting the ceremony soon. And before that, we have some uh, things that we would like to ask you. Please switch off uh, the alarms on your watches and also make sure that your smartphones or cell phones are on silent mode. 
and please refrain from taking any photographs or any recordings during the program. Uh, if we find anybody who are recording or taking photographs, we may ask you to hand over your uh, recording devices during the program. And also, we will be streaming live over our official YouTube channel, so we hope to have your understanding. And we have simultaneous interpretation from Japanese to English. So um, if you would like to listen in English, please utilize the receivers. And in case of any emergencies, uh, please uh, follow the instruction of the staff and please evacuate from the nearest exit. Now, after this, uh, we will start the ceremony from 1 p.m. It's about five minutes away. So please wait until we uh, start the official ceremony. So 151 years since its inception and 50 years anniversary. So I entered the university in 1986. So it's about 40 years ago. Back then, I remember that there weren't many facilities around the campus. And it was right after this science expo in Scuba. So uh, the place felt rather lonely because there weren't many facilities around the campus. But now um, it's flourishing. Well, I also uh, entered in 1991. It, uh, the expo was already far away. And back then, the highway was established. But I heard rumors about a train service being established. But during my days, uh, the train service didn't start. But now we have the Tsukuba Express. And um, that is helping this town to flourish. And yes, I see that the trees have grown big. Um, in the past, it was just like a vacant field. It was like a big... A uh, green field, but now uh, we have this very international green city. And I actually visited the university. I see many uh, familiar buildings. Um, I went to the Hirasuna second building, um, and it uh, reminds me of those days. And yes, uh, the buildings bring back great memories. So how will the university develop in the new phase, in the next 50 years? That's something that we would like to look forward to. And we will be starting shortly. Um, it's about the ceremony. I will officially start in about two minutes. So please wait a while.
本日はご多忙のところ早期151年 Thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come to the、uh, University of Tsukuba's 151st and 50th anniversary ceremony I will be serving as a moderator, a、uh, 1990 graduate of the College of Social Sciences, first、uh, the cluster of colleges, and former executive announcer of the Japan Broadcasting Corporation, Shinichi Taketa. My name is Yuko Aoyama, and I will also be moderating the event I graduated from the School of、uh, Health and Physical Education in 1995 and a former announcer of the Japan Broadcasting Corporation. Thank you very much. First, we would like to invite an opening address from Dr. Kazuhiko Kato, Vice President and Director of the University of Tsukuba. Now we start the University of Tsukuba's 151st plus 50th anniversary ceremony. That was Vice President、uh, Dr. Kato giving the opening address. Now I'd like to introduce to you the guests who are、uh, on the stage. Minister Masahito Moriyama, Education, Culture, Sports, Science, and Technology, could not join us today due to commitments. On his behalf, we have、uh, Mr. Nobue Yasue. Nobu Oyasue, rather, Parliamentary Vice Minister of、uh, the Ministry, with us. From、uh, Malaysia, we have the fourth and the seventh Prime Minister,、uh, Dr. Mahathir bin Mohamad. From Republic of France, President of Grenoble Alps University, Professor Yassine Araknesh. The mayor of Tsukuba City, Dr. Tatsuo Igarashi. Mayor Igarashi graduated from the School of International Studies in 2002, and he is also graduated from the Graduate School of Humanities and Social Sciences in 2007. Now, University of Tsukuba President Dr. Kyosuke Nagata would like to give the、uh, ceremonial address. Please start. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for attending our ceremony to. Celebrate the 151st and 50th anniversary of the University of Tsukuba. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank you all for your kind support and advice. And the Education Minister, Mr. Masahito Moriyama, Dr. Mahathir bin Mohamed, former Prime Minister of Malaysia, Professor Yasin Laknek, President of University Grenoble Alps, and the heads of universities and research institutes around Japan and overseas, ambassadors from、uh, many countries, and lawmakers from Ibaraki, Dr. Tatsuo Igarashi, Mayor of Tsukuba. Thank you very much for attending our ceremony today. As was、uh, introduced from the moderators, The inception of our school goes back to 1872. The Meiji government established the oldest higher education institute,、uh, which was the normal school back then, and that became the Tokyo Higher Normal School, Tokyo University of Literature and Science, and Tokyo University of Education. And then in, on October 1st, 1973, the, in Tsukuba Science City, the University, was,、uh, the university of Tsukuba was opened. And today we are celebrating. Now, we wanted to become a university with a new concept, and the founding principles uphold transdisciplinarity and internationalization. And the university is a general university that covers a wide area of academia. And we have carried out that challenge over the years. We have many professors that 
were Nobel laureates 50 years ago. Uh, this was just a Hitachi no plane, but we have turned out Olympic and Paralympic medalists and also people who are active in all kinds of areas in the society. Toward the next 50 years, the new concept university will become a future concept university. Now we are, want to develop a new concept like that. Based on the Basic Education Act, the, the mission of a university is to advance research and education to contribute to society. And we have had as our mission resolving global scale issues through the creation of knowledge and also churning out human resources uh, to lead the way. We wanted to become an engine of transformation of society and together with partners uh, that share the same kind of ambition, uh, we wanted to become a transporter education model and we wanted to become the basis of a future society. We wanted to create a global trust uh, for that. We believe that the basis of university education and the basis of societal issues is the advancement of research. It is all about learning about the phase transition over the 13.8 billion years since the inception of the universe until today. It is about the creation of the universe and materials, the birth of life and humanity, creation of language and civilization, and the development of society and culture. It is, this will be the motor for societal change. And based on interdisciplinary collaboration, uh, new materials, hydrogen, nuclear fission, um, energy development, and new development of medicine, and new mobility, robotics, art, sports that uh, stimulates people's emotions, and it, and uh, innovation in society. This, these are all what will be supported. Turning out students that will support the future is a great joy. When COVID hit, there were no students on campus. Even if you go to the cafeteria, if you go to the school grounds, there were no students that, to be found. It was very lonely, and I thought that universities need students. That was a very strong feeling that I had. Today in Japan, we have a declining birth rate, but in order to overcome this, we need to have all kinds of diverse students with diverse knowledge and characteristics, and they need to exert their knowledge and capabilities. So we want to transform education and we also want to change and establish a place for study and life. Here in Japan, unique talents sometimes go unnoticed. There are many students who come from overseas who feel a friendship towards Japan. We want to have female students who are interested in STEM. We want to seek them out. We want to nurture diverse human resources so that we can create a society where all these kind of talents can really shine. The new knowledge and people who lead the way can contribute to society and the community. And of course, that community for us is Tsukuba and Japan. Tsukuba is a world research city. The Tsukuba Science City has housed public and private research institutes, and we have been strengthening education and research. The research results from Tsukuba will be utilized in the industry. And for that, we are planning to establish an Imagine the Future Forum. We want to invite research uh, de uh, departments from companies and uh, work all the way from the needs of the companies all the way to business creation. And we want to make sure that we can have social implementation of research results that would lead to innovation. Now, for us, the world is also linked to our university. The Higher Normal School, which was our predecessor, and the school headmaster back then, Jigoro Kano, was the founder of judo as we know it today. But over his 23-year term, he has accepted many international students, and that legacy is alive today. In our university, we have a lot of international students. We are truly an internationalized university. and. One project for internationalization is the campus in campus concept. 
With collaborative universities around the world, we are sharing our campus functions. We have a barrier-free study environment where students and faculty and researchers can have free exchange. And with our collaborative universities, we are inviting research in units here so that we can have a universal uh, research uh, activity. And we want to have these exchanges of brain and knowledge and we want to become the crossroads of knowledge for the future global society. Today, the world faces climate change, infectious diseases, security um, environment changes, and also we see disparity becoming more serious and deepening division. We have heaps of global issues. Here in Japan, declining birth rate, aging society, and the decrease in labor force, concentration in Tokyo, uh, and weakening of local communities. Uh, we have a lot of structural issues, and we also are bound by fixed ideas. But we want to lead the way of university reform. We want to become the engine of reestablishing uh, the society and in order to have a hopeful uh, future and also for perpetual peace through knowledge and art, we want to lead humanity toward a brighter and more happier future. As we celebrate the 50th anniversary, uh, we want to make sure that we continue on the path of upholding our foundational philosophy. And for the next 50 years, we want to transform society through research and education. And for the next 50 years, our slogan is design the future together. We, want, we will uphold respect for uh, history and with great expectations toward the future, we will overcome all kinds of boundaries and deepen our engagement with society as we go along the path. And these transformations, we want, uh, we need collaboration with stakeholders around the world and the cooperation of our alumni and also the support of our local community. Lastly, but not least, I would like to ask you for your continued support and advice to our university and also hoping for your future health and prosperity. With that, I would like to end my opening remarks. September 30th, 2023, Kyosuke Nagata. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Next, we will receive congratulatory messages from our guests. The first message by Mr. Moriyama, Minister of Education, Culture, Sports, Science, and Technology, will be read by the Parliamentary Vice Minister, Mr. Nobuo Yasue, on his behalf. Thank you for the introduction. I'm Nobuo Yasue, Parliamentary Vice Minister of Education, Culture, Sports, Science, and Technology. And uh, it is my greatest pleasure to be able to offer a few words of congratulations to celebrate the 151st class 50th anniversary ceremony for Tsukuba University. And I will read uh, Mr. Moriyama's uh, message instead. It is my greatest pleasure to be able to offer a few words of congr congratulations to celebrate the 151st plus 50th anniversary of the University of Tsukuba. The University of Tsukuba was founded as a normal school by the Meiji government in 1880, and since its founding, it has been serving as Japan's first public higher education institution for 151 years and has sent out many talented people into society. The University of Tsukuba took the opportunity of the relocation of its predecessor institution, Tokyo University of Education, with, with such features as openness, a new system for education and research, and new university autonomy as core founding principles, and was opened in October 1973. Since then, it merged with the University of Library and Information Science in 2002, became a national university corporation in 2004, and then became a designated national university. City Corporation in 2020. 
During this time, the university has always played a leading role in university reform and at the same time promote the creation of universities with the aim of achieving higher levels of sophistication in education and research, enabling universities to gain individualized characteristics, thus making tremendous contribution to the development of Japan. In recent years, we have received cooperation from the Malaysian government to open the University of Tsukuba Malaysia branch in September next year as the first overseas branch of a Japanese university, thereby leading the internationalization of higher education and playing a major role in the international community. The University of Tsukuba, with such great achievements and characteristics, has been able to build up a long history since its founding of the uh, predecessor 151 years ago and now uh, 50 years ago because of the tremendous efforts by hard work of President Kyosuke Nagata, past presidents, faculty and staff, uh, graduates and many people who have supported the university. I would like to express my deepest appreciation. Within the current circumstances, the University of Tsukabu will continue to follow its founding principles, maintaining broad perspectives not only in Japan but also to the world at large and through our inherent knowledge of accumulated throughout its long history uh, since the inception of the predecessor and establishment of university 50 years ago. It will play important roles in development human resources in the international perspectives. In closing, I'd like to thank all of you present today for your continued support and cooperation for the university and would like to extend my best wishes for the continued development of the University of Tsukuba and all of you. September 30th, 2023, Minister of Education, Culture, Sports, Science and Technology, Masahito Moriyama. Once again, congratulations. Thank you very much for the delivery of the message. It was Mr. Ese who read the message of Minister of Education on his behalf. I would now like to introduce Dr. Mahabir bin Mohammad, former Prime Minister of Malaysia, who will be turning 20 at uh, 98 years old soon. He has had a 20 year long administration with the Look East policy. He's a legendary politician from Malaysia. He also served as the prime minister of the country for the second time from 2018 to 2020. In fall 2024, University of Tsukuba will be opening an international branch office for the first time as a Japanese public university in Malaysia, based on an agreement between former prime minister Mahathir and the late prime minister Abe. Floor is yours, doctor. Parliamentary Vice Minister of Education, Culture, Sports, Science and Technology, Professor Yasin Lachnes, President of Grenoble Elves University, Dr. Igarashi Tetsuo, Mayor, City of Scuba, Dr. Shirakawa Hideki, Professor Emeritus, University of Tsukuba, Nobel Prize winner for chemistry, excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to say thank you very much for this invitation to join in the celebration of Tsukuba University's 50 years, 50 years anniversary. I understand that the institution is 151 years old, but it has become a university only in the past 50 years. The university has enjoyed such a sterling reputation and the students who studied here had benefited tremendously. I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate Scuba University on achieving this important and significant milestone. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Japanese educationists must be aware about Malaysia's Look East policy. I first visited Japan in 1961, and I was impressed with the Japanese work culture, commitment, dedication, and concern over quality. I thought that if Malaysians adopt this culture, we too could be successful, hence the Look East policy. Since the adoption of this policy, Malaysia has sent 26,000 students to Japan. But if a Japanese university is located in Malaysia, more students from many countries would benefit from Japanese systems of education and Japanese work ethics. I believe Tsukuba University has decided to launch its branch in Malaysia by September 2024, next year. At present, there are branch universities from the United Kingdom, Australia, India, and China. They are all doing very well. Students from Africa, Central Asia, ASEAN countries, and Arab countries are now studying in Malaysia. So to a certain extent, Malaysia has become a center of education. With the founding of the branch University of Sukuba, it will complete the picture of Malaysia as a center for education. The reason why Malaysia is popular for higher education is because the cost in Malaysia is low. I believe Sukuba University's decision to set up a branch university in Malaysia will be equally successful. I am sure it will enhance the good relations between Malaysia and Japan. There will also be opportunities for working with Malaysian universities. I look forward to the setting up of the branch university in Malaysia. I understand that Sukuba University is focused more on the sciences than in other areas. Now, science has become a very important field of learning. We all benefit from the findings of the researchers in science. And today, we live in a world that has become smaller because of ease of communication. Where before, to travel from Japan to Malaysia would take four months or five months by sailing ships. Today, it takes only six hours. Such is the re reduction in times of uh, distance between Malaysia and Japan. But then the world is now very connected. We have all kinds of new ways of, con of contacting each other from all over the world. In fact, today, we can have conferences without people having to move to any particular place. Staying where they are, we can have a conference through Zoom. That is to say that everybody gets on the phone and the voices and the pictures are broadcast to the center so that everybody feels as if they are all in the same room. Such is the progress of information technology today. And this makes the world smaller. And we are now in contact with each other. And when we are in contact with each other, we can develop good friendship and understand each other better. Unfortunately, 
when, when there is close contact, there may also be a lot of conflicts. And conflicts may lead to violence, to wars. This is very unfortunate because while we appreciate the work of researchers in finding new uh, ways of communicating, we also find that there are now new ways of destruction, of killing, of wars, which does not recognize anybody except as victims of the wars. So we need the world to come together more closely and make use of information technology in order to understand each other's problem. We need also to cultivate a new culture that regards war as a crime, and therefore we should all go be against uh, wars such as the one that is being fought between Russia and Ukraine today. So science will play a very great part in the future of humanity. And I would like to say how much, how ap appreciative we are that Sukuba is going to have a branch university in Malaysia where I am quite sure acting together with Malaysian universities, there will be researchers into the climate change, for example. Uh, we are faced with this problem of climate change. Of course, this planet has been going through climate change over the billions of years. There was a time when there were dinosaurs. There was a time also when the world, world was covered with ice. Then the ice melted and there is the appearance of the seas and the continents. And then came human civilization. But human civilization is to be, if it is to be maintained, must learn how to deal with climate changes. And I hope that in this field, Sukuba University in Japan and in Malaysia will contribute much to the ways to deal with the climate change, which today is causing a lot of uh, problems, uh, death and destruction all over the world. So once again, I, would like to I would like to congratulate Sukuba University on your 50th anniversary. And I would like to thank you very much for the decision to set up the branch university in Malaysia. I thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mahathir. So we have received a congratulatory remark from Dr. Mahathir. Next, from France, from uh, the president of University Grenoble Alps, uh, we would like to receive a remark from Professor Yassine Laknesh. Our university has a lot of exchanges with other universities, and of also we have exchanges among presidents. Well, presidents may change, but I believe Professor Laknesh, uh, we have had we have enjoyed a very long uh, term relationship with you. Uh, he is a renowned researcher of computer science, and from 2020 in January has become the president of the University Grenoble Alps, and with the university, we have a campus-in-campus -campus partnership arrangement and for the research of semiconductor material together with the University of Grenoble Alps uh, and with CNRS as well as our university. We, uh, we have established the International Joint Research Lab called JFAST. So Professor Laknesh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. 
technology. Dear Prime Minister, dear Mayor of Tsukuba, dear officials, Honorable President of University of Tsukuba, Professor Kyuzuki Nagata Sansei, dear Chancellors, Presidents, and former Presidents, fellow delegates, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Université Grenoble is proud and happy to have been a partner of the University of Tsukuba for 26 years. We began collaborating in the field of education in 1997, and since then, we have been always impressed by its international openness and determination to move forward without borders, without limits. Every year, we discuss new ideas, new collaborations, new projects. This is both a challenge and a stimulus, and it is a prerequisite for maintaining our status of world leading universities. To name just a few examples, last year, we opened a new international materials laboratory that involves a world leading company. A few days ago, we signed a new double master's degree in computer science. This week, we jointly organized a successful symposium on the role of humanities and social sciences in facing global challenges. And this autumn, we are planning two seminars on risk and the resilience. Throughout these 26 years of collaboration, we have learned from each other. And in the ongoing evolution of the University of Tsukuba, we feel the spirit of Jigoro Kano, the founder of Kokodan Judo and former director of this university. Jigoro Kano's teachings are numerous, and I'll mention the following first. The purpose of the study of Judo is to perfect, perfect yourself and to contribute to society. He stresses the importance of personal development in the training of talented people who will be key players in society. But by combining the same, same sentence, the quest for self-perfection on one hand and contribution to society on the other hand, he tells us something profound that must be a guiding value for universities, teachers, and researchers. And this is also something we share with the University of Tsukuba. Another quote from Jigoro Kanu is, nothing under the sun is greater than education. By educating one person and sending him into the society of his generation, you make contribution extending 100 generations to come. He was a wise man and a visionary, and so is the leadership of the University of Tsukuba. This onerous responsibility incumbent upon universities takes a whole new dimension in our constantly changing world. Imagine the future and preparing new generations for it. However, climate change will make our planet a difficult place to live for generations to come, if nothing is done. The future must be designed so that our children can live in a sustainable, prosperous, and peaceful world. This is the responsibility of all of us, including international, national, and local authorities who must take decisions based on scientifically established facts anytime this is possible. Universities should tackle the societal challenge through dedicated research and innovation and prepare new generations to build and live on a sustainable planet. In fact, our universities are doing so. I would like to congratulate the University of Tsukuba for all its achievements of the 50, last 50 years. I hope that Japanese and local authorities are aware of universities of Tsukuba's worldwide outreach that goes much beyond its scientific and education activities impact. We are proud and happy to be partner, its partner. Let's design the future together. Tsukuba daigakunu mazu mazu no gaaten wo yunori itashamizu. 
ありがとうございました Thank you very much. We just received a message from the president of University Grenoble Alps, Professor Yassine Lachnaj. Now we have uh, received messages from our students. Congratulations on the 50th anniversary. Namaste. Congratulations on the 50th anniversary to the University of Tsukuba. I love you. Feliz aniversario, Universidad Tsukuba. Congratulations on the 50th anniversary. Tanjitlian Baidim in Turiv. Goju Shunen, Omedeto Gozaimas. Universidad de Tsukuba, parabéns pelo seu 50 anos. Hi, Kakusei Tashikarado. Thank you very much. Those are the messages. Uh, in different languages uh, from our students, but we heard the name Tsukuba from all of them. We're very glad to hear that. Now, I would like to introduce to you the guests who are with us today. I call your names and please stand up, turn and show your faces to the participants at the back of the room before taking your seats. Members of the House of Representatives, Mr. Yamato Aoyama, Mr. Akimasa Ishikawa. Ms. Ayano Kunimitsu. Mr. Nobuyuki Fukushima. We also have members of the House of Councillors, Mr. Takumi Onuma. And Ms. Makiko Dogomi. Mr. Gyosuke uh, Kozuki of the House of Councillors, Mr. Akio Kao, Akio, and uh, Mr. Uh, Ryosuke Kozuki of uh, the House of Councillors are not here with us, but we have, uh, but they are represented by another person. Now, I'd like to introduce to you the ambassadors to Japan who are attending here today, but due to time constraints, please refer to the screen for their names. Ambassadors uh, uh, are now requested to stand up. We have many ambassadors with us. Yes, the ambassadors to Japan who are here with us today. And thank you very much for taking your time out of your busy schedules. I would also like to introduce the presidents of overseas universities who are with us today. Their names will be on the screen at the front. Presidents of overseas universities, please, uh, you're requested to stand up. The presidents of overseas universities were with us today, and thank you very much for traveling a very long distance to be with us. We also introduce to you the presidents of universities in Japan who are with us and their names are on the screen. Presidents of Japanese universities, please stand up where you are. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being with us despite your busy schedules. Now, I would also like to introduce the names of the heads of national institutions and independent administrative agencies who are with us. Their names are on the screen. 
I know the uh, slide is rather busy, but as you can see, we have a large number of people attending from Japan and elsewhere in the world. In addition, we have a large number of people with ties to our universities in attendance today, including government officials, companies, professors, emeritus of our university, alumni, and former employees. Due to time constraints, I cannot introduce them to you, but I'd like to thank you very much for being with us. We have received uh, congratulatory letters and telegrams from various quarters. Also, the fifth president of the University of Tsukuba, Professor Emeritus Leona Ezaki, has kindly sent a video message. Dr. Ezaki won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1973. So it is the 50th anniversary of his winning the Nobel Prize as well. Do you know the name of this hall where you are at now? It is named Leo Izaki Main Hall. So it is bearing the name of Dr. Izaki. To the president of the University of Tsukuba, faculty members, students, alumni, supporters, and distinguished guests, I would like to extend my heartfelt congratulations on the 50th anniversary of the University of Tsukuba. It is a great honor for me as a former president to deliver this congratulatory speech on this auspicious occasion. Indeed, I was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in the same year as the university's founding in 1973. So for me, this year holds a special significance in two ways. During my tenure as president, the University of Tsukuba celebrated its 20th anniversary. In my commemorative speech congratulating the anniversary, I stated that I would actively promote the development of graduate programs to transform the University of Tsukuba into a first-rate research university that can make unique contributions to the international community and that look forward to producing many Nobel laureates in the future. Now, 30 years have passed since then, and the emphasis on graduate education has evolved, particularly under President Yasuki Tahara's leadership with the reorganization of graduate research programs. As for Nobel Prizes, we were delighted to hear of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry awarded to Hideki Shirakawa, who is present here today in the year 2000. Furthermore, under the President Yamata's guidance, the university has become a designated National University Corporation in 2022. It is a great source of joy to see the university making significant strides towards becoming a first-rate school. Speaking of milestones, there is a saying in the analytics of Confucius, at 50, I knew the mandate of heaven. Now that the mandate of heaven, what is the mandate of heaven for the University of Tsukuba as it celebrates its 50th anniversary? As you know, the University of Tsukuba was established upon the relocation of Tokyo University of Education, but Tsukuba is not merely another national university. This is because at the time, forward-thinking pioneers embarked on a significant transformation of the university's traditional systems in a pursuit of university that aligned with the needs of times. In essence, it was a grand experiment. In the U.S., at the entrance of Bell Labs in New Jersey, there stands a bust of Alexander Graham Bell, who is considered one of the greatest investors of the 19th century. Beneath it, the words are engraved. Leave the bitten track occasionally. Dive into the woods. You will certainly find something you have never seen before. In this era of change, let us encourage our university to depart from the beaten path and venture into the unknown, just like diving into the woods. It is there that we are certain to discover something entirely new. In stable societies, it is natural to assume that the future will be a continuation of the present. However, during times of transformation, straying from the well-trodden path can lead to a birth of innovative ideas and the creation of a future unlike anything we have seen before. As we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the University of Tsukuba, I offer my congratulations and best wishes for the university's continued growth and achievement. Thank you.
Thank you very much. And the sixth president, um, Professor Yasuo Kitahara, unfortunately was not able to attend today. But we have received a lot of congratulatory messages from many people. And some of the messages uh, you will be able to read um, because we have uh, put them up outside in the hall. So we hope you can take time to read the messages. So thank you for all your kind messages. And um, we have come through this ceremony to commemorate the 151 years since inception and the 50th anniversary of the University of Tsukuba. Now, we would like to have the vice president of the University of Tsukuba, uh, Chizuru Nishio, to declare the closing of this ceremony. Uh, with this, I would like to declare the closing of this ceremony to commemorate the 151st year and the 50th anniversary of the University of Scuba. Thank you very much. That was Vice President Nishio. And with this, we would like to close the ceremony commemorating the 151st year since the inception and the 50th anniversary from the opening of the University of Tsukuba. Thank you very much for your kind attendance. Now from 2 p.m., uh, we will be hearing a lecture by Dr. Hideki Shirakawa entitled My Research and Tsukuba. Tokyo Institute of Technology, University of Pennsylvania, University of Tsukuba. And now I'd like to ask our guests on the stage to go back to your seats. Um, and please follow the, our staff. Thank you very much. And we would like to have a big round of applause. Thank you. ま、大学の列は1873年に国内外問わず開かれた大学という理念のもと大学は誕生しました。多くの分野で世界トップレベルの高度な研究が行われており、オリンピック・パラリンピックのメダル獲得者を多数輩出するとともに、ノーベル賞受賞者も輩出しているユニークな大学です。筑波大学は2022年4月
そして2023年師範学校設立から151年筑波大学が開学して50周年を迎えますまず一番言えるのは日本で最も古い高等教育機関それから最も新しい国立の総合大学ですそういう意味でまず新しい特徴古い特徴両方持った大学ですそれから日本で一番いろんな分野を持った大学ではないかなあのよく他には類のない学問分野を持ちと言われている大学です歴史と伝統の中でこの間ずっとあの培っていたのは高い国際性とそれから学際性ということだと思いますまあ、いろんな学問分野の垣根が低いんですね研究学園都市に筑波大学はあるんですが、えー、科学技術の進歩が見える町の収穫の大学ということにあのこれからなっていきたいなと思っています実は見学の理念の中に固定化された大学や社会への挑戦をするんだということが書かれていて新しい取り組み取り組んで固定化された概念は壊すという大学になっていきたいあの大学を支えていただいているステークホルダーの方々本当にいろんなあの方々がいらっしゃいますもちろんその一番の中心は卒業生修了生の方々だと思っていますそれを含めてこれから社会の方々とのエンゲージメントを進めていきたいと思っていますエンゲージメントって何かなってうん、いろんな解釈がありますけれども支え支えられという関係のことだというふうに考えてこれから多くのステークホルダーの方々と共に歩いていきたいと思っています。
cherry trees of Tsukuba it brings back memories. It was like we were embraced by the cherry trees, and I remember having parties under the cherry trees. Well, uh, parties to, of course, uh, welcome the freshmen. And yes, I remember being nervous about living alone for the first time. Well, now it's almost 2 p.m. And from 2 p.m., we will be hearing from Dr. Hideki Shirakawa. But until then, please wait a while. And we will be starting shortly. Ladies and gentlemen, we would now like to hear from Dr. Hideki Shirakawa, the Nobel Prize laureate in chemistry. Uh, the lecture is entitled My Research and Tsukuba, Tokyo Institute of Technology, University of Pennsylvania, University of Tsukuba. To introduce our commemorative lecturer, we would like to have the Vice President and Executive Director for Research, Dr. Yasuteru Shigeta. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming um, to our event today. And today, I will be serving as the facilitator for this part where we listen to a commemorative lecture by Dr. Hideki Shirakawa. Now, before the lecture, I would like to um, introduce um, his many achievements. Dr. Shirakawa was born in 1936 in Tokyo. And from elementary school to high school, uh, he has spent time in Gifu. And after that, in 1966, he entered uh, uh, the doctoral uh, course of Tokyo Institute of Technology and um, received his doctoral degree. And at the same time, in the same year, he became assistant at the Research Laboratory for Resources Utilization of the Tokyo Institute of Technology. And then in 1976, he went to the United States and became a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Pennsylvania. From 1979, he became an assistant professor at the Institute of Material Science of University of Tsukuba and then became professor. And now he is professor emeritus of the University of Tsukuba. And I believe all of you will know, but I would like to point out some of his major achievements. Plastic is not conductive. That was the common sense. However, he came up with the idea um, of researching conductive polymers and the polyethylene of thin films and chemical doping for creating conduciveness, conductiveness, and acetylene polymers. So uh, he has four major achievements, actually. But uh, because of these achievements, in 1983, he received an award for the uh, research of polymer. And then in 2000, for his, with Dr. Alan McDiamick and, and Dr. Heger, um, he received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2000. And he also received the Order of Culture and was selected as the Person of Cultural Merit on, in the same year. 
and he will be talking about my research and Tsukuba, Tokyo Institute of Technology, University of Pennsylvania, University of Tsukuba. And he will be talking about how he uh, came up with the research, which received the Nobel, Nobel Prize in Chemistry, and he will be sending out a message to young researchers-to-be. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Professor or Dr. Shirakawa, please. The floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction. I am Dr. Shirakawa. The University of Tsukuba 151st and 50th anniversary ceremony. I have an opportunity to speak at the ceremony, and I'd like to thank all the persons uh, concerned for giving me this opportunity. Well, so far, the ceremony had been rather formal, but my talk is going to be rather an easy talk, which you can listen to uh, in a more relaxed manner. Now, as the title here says, my research my research and education had been done in three different educational institutions one of which is the Tokyo Institute of Technology also University of Pennsylvania and here at University of Tsukuba. Now, I spent the longest time with the University of Tsukuba. It has been a little more than 20 years since I joined the University of Tsukuba. Therefore, the University of Tsukuba is the place where I have a lot of dear memories in terms of research as well as in education. Now, let me briefly introduce you to you the history of my research at Tokyo Institute of Technology. I was an assistant at Research Laboratory for Resource Utilization during this period. Then I went to University of Pennsylvania, but I was there for only a short time, one year. But this is the time where I had uh, very good memories with good outcomes in my research. And then from November 1979 until my retirement in March 2000, I had been at the Institute of Material Sciences at University of Tsukuba and also uh, the professor of uh, basic uh, research uh, department in science and engineering. In terms of research activities, I had done, I had been involved in different research activities as Professor Shigeta has just introduced to you. These are the type of activities I was engaged in. And during my time at University of Pennsylvania, I had an opportunity to discover the doping effect and then I moved to the University of Tsukuba, where I was uh, involved in researching stretch orientation and uh, properties of polyacetylene, also the synthesis of uh, uh, oriented polyacetylene used through polymerization with liquid crystal as catalyst. And also I studied properties. Acetylene has uh, two carbons and two hydrogen. Carbon, carbon are bonded in two triple bonding. Now, if this is a double bonding, it will be an ethylene. However, ethylene is polymerized to synthesize polyethylene, which is the most commonly used plastic materials today. Now, when it comes to acetylene polymers, through tigler nata catal catalyst, if you polymerize, then the acetylene becomes polyacetylene. And then you have the ring bonding and double bonding uh, alternatively in a very unique uh, high polymer. Now, this is the pol high polymer 
which was believed to become an electroconductive plastic, uh, therefore, both in the uh, chemistry and physics, it had been a hot topic. If we can indeed develop a polymer like this, it should be electroconductive. That had been a theory at least. Therefore, the scientists in uh, material synthesis have all tried to synthesize this material, but they all failed because it had been extremely difficult. It may sim seem to be have simple structure, but in reality, it is very complex. And as a result of synthesis, we various experiments, we are only able to obtain powders, very black powders that are not adequate for any types of measurements. That's been the outcome of all the research and experiments. Plastics may not be soluble in synthesis process, but as long as you have good solvents, if you dissolve in the solvent, you could develop film or other forms of the material. But when it comes to polyacetylene, whatever solvents you use, it would not dissolve. And even with addition of heat, it would not become soft. That had been the property of this substance. And people around the world have tried very hard to synthesize this substance. But whichever researcher or the research groups had only been able to obtain a completely dark powder. So the research topics given to me had been to uh, not to study the electric uh, conductance according to the theory, but to identify how we can progress the polymerization mechanism. In other words, the triple bonding of acetylene would open. As a result, double bonding structure should be formed. And how would it react to catalysts so that polymers could be synthesized? Identifying the reactive mechanism of polymerization had been the subject of uh, research given to me. And when we started the research, naturally, the polymerization method had been to follow the preceding researchers. So we only had dark powder, but at one time, by incidence, by an intended, unintended process, we have seen a, a substance that are not powders, but those that was in the state that resembled a totally black rag, a ragged piece of clothes. It was not a powder. Therefore, clearly, we thought that the experiment was a failure and it happened because we did use a very high concentration, 1,000-fold higher concentration level of the catalyst. That was a concern we had because we had a failure. Now it resembled a completely black rag, but we thought that perhaps we may be able to improve on that substance so that we may be able to develop a nice thin film. Therefore, just because it was a failure, we decided that we would try to develop a better form, perhaps a thin film, and we try to find ways. And another direct objective was to find out why we failed and why we've developed this form. So, we have continued our research. Then we found ways to develop a thin film of polyacetylene, which looked like this. It was a silver glittering film that we were able to form. Now, oh, the black compared to the black powder that we had developed, although the substance itself the pro itself is the same, but how it is formed is completely different from what we had before. And we showed this to the researchers at academic societies, and they asked, what is the, ma the, the metal we used in order to coat it with the uh, polymer, uh, the, the polymer? Because it, looked, it really looked like an aluminum foil. And uh, we thought that in order to identify the polymerization mechanism, we thought that we would be able to analyze the structures with this form. And that's what we have started to do. 
then in less than three years, the we succeeded in identifying and elucidating the initial polymerization mechanism. Since then, now that we have the nice film made, we've tried to make it a graphite, or it could be led into many different research activities. We've tried, but all of them either failed or uh, we could barely make uh, a single uh, reporting to societies, and that time lasted for another six to seven years. In the process, I had an encounter with a professor, Professor Alan G. McDiarmid, whom I will uh, would uh, be receiving Nobel uh, Prize in the future in 2000. But my encounter was in 1975. He was at the University of Kyoto as an exchange professor, and he spoke. He gave a lecture in Tokyo at the University of Tokyo at the Material Institute. He gave a lecture. And after the lecture, I showed him the polyethylene thin film. And looking at the silver glittering film, Literally, he was so surprised, he almost jumped up, and he said he wanted to do the research with me and invited me to the United States. I was surprised to see how surprised he was. The reasons why he was so surprised, I will explain to you later. But uh, he invited me to uh, the United States, and in September 1976, I visited the chemistry department of the University of Pennsylvania. That was the time when Professor McDiarmid was working together with another, uh, the laureate, joint, uh, laureate of the Nobel Prize, Dr. Uh, Alan J. Heger of the physics department. Dr. Heger was responsible for study of a property of the material, and as a, a method, the synthesis was uh, being uh, studied in this joint research activity. Now, in September 1976, I went to the University of Pennsylvania and uh, started to uh, try to synthesize polyacetylene. Now, two months later, in Dr. Heger's laboratory, I was able to discover the doping effect. The Dr. Heger is in physics department. I joined uh, his uh, co-research uh, activities, and I started to engage in research to identify physical properties of polyacetylene. The very basics of physical property is whether it is conducive or not to electricity. It so happened that I have tried to add some uh, additives, impurities, to the materials, and now we use the word doping. There was a time when doping, the word, was not used in the field of chemistry, but we have tried to do some doping. And a minute amount of bromine was added to polyacetylene thin film. Now, for uh, the, uh, the lines, of uh, the platinum lines were added to polyacetylene, it was it put, entered into a flask. And at the uh, normal temperature and the pressure, uh, less than a drop of the uh, addition additives were given, and then the electric conductivity increased by six digits, and the electric uh, conductivity was uh, now comparable to that of metal. Here, you're looking at a piece of my metal, and this is a logarithmic uh, graph. Horizontally, you're looking at time. Vertically, the, uh, the, uh, the comparative electricity, the conductivity, and you uh, leave the current, measure the, the level, and then we have calculated the conductivity level and plotted it on the graph in a short period of time. In other words, when uh, this is a, a, a minute for a line, so 10 minutes 
20 minutes in less than 30 minutes, 1 million times increase in the conductivity was identified. And that was really a big discovery. And in the subsequent year, in May 1977, it so happened that in New York, there was an international Congress meeting held and we published this outcome. Many physicists, as well as uh, synthesize uh, the chemists who are involved in synthesis, they developed interest, not just universities around the world, but uh, uh, the researchers all around and across, the people from businesses, the industries, they all engaged in this research in, with, with an expectation to read, lead to further discoveries. So a lot of uh, interest was on this dropping effect. And then um, on October 10th, the year 2000, the Nobel, uh, the committee for selection of the Nobel Prize made a, a publication. And it says that the discovery of insulating materials the, the discovery of electric conductive uh, plastic uh, have uh, been a very innovative and unique in overturning the, the common knowledge that uh, but the organic materials are insulators. From left to right, Professor Healer and Professor McDiarmid and myself. So three persons have been awarded with the prize. December 10th was the awarding ceremony. Two days prior to the ceremony, on the 8th of November, there has been a commemorative lecture where each of the three of us were given opportunity to give a lecture of 45 minutes each. After the three lectures by ourselves, the Master of Ceremony of this lecture, Dr. Nolden, were introduced as the three princes of Serendip. Listening to the word Serendip princess, have I learned that the selection committee have looked into all the feelers that we had to go through and understood that they knew how serendipity have worked for our success. Not saying the exact word, but referring to the story that became the origin of the serendipity that he introduced the three of us. So it was quite impeccable and impressive the way he introduced us. And in 2004, our book had been formulated into the three principal princes of Serendip, translated into Japanese. And you can read what I have just said in this book. So the three Sri Lankan princes have been referred to who have made amazing discoveries leading to great inventions. This is a story which was first created in the fifth Sri Lanka, which was then disseminated to the Western world, which was then translated into Japanese. So serendipity is the ability triggered by the chance of failure to make inventions and discoveries that are more wonderful than the intended purses. So again, I was very surprised, presently surprised, to learn that the Nobel Prize Selection Committee, whose parent organization is the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, even investigated the failures of the experiments we went through. And this is how I landed on Tsukuba University. And now I would like to discuss my memories I returned to Japan in August 1977 and returned to work at the Tokyo Institute of Technology's Institute of Chemical Resources. There I continued my research in polyethylene 
And one year later or so, I received a phone call from Professor Makoto Okazaki, who was the head of the Department of Material Science and Engineering at the recently founded University of Scuba. I didn't know him personally back then, but I have been informed that Tsukuba University was just recently founded, but it was a place that I have never been to. But he personally placed a phone call asking me if I wanted to come to Tsukuba. I thought it, the offer was quite refreshing because back then when transferring between universities, it was customary to apply for an open recruitment program with the permission of the head of the department or the senior professor. Or when it was not an open recruitment process, the proposal would still proceed through the head of the faculty. So I felt that the way he gave me the offer was very fresh and favorable. As I was in a position that required a transfer to another institution anyway, I happily and readily accepted the offer. Professor Okazaki, after receiving my consent, talked to my supervisor about my transfer. In November 1979, I was transferred to the University of Tsukuba as an assistant professor in the area of material science. When I returned from the United States, my research results were highly evaluated by my fellow researchers in polymer synthesis, but they were also evaluated favorably by researchers in condensed matter physics, which were completely unrelated to my research area. Professor Okazaki was a theoretical physicist, but apparently one of the great supporter of my research was Professor Okazaki, who was the head of the Department of Materials Engineering. The University of Tsukuba was established as a new concept university. And I was informed that it is a university open to the world with a new system of teaching and research with a new form of autonomy on campus. It was inaugurated as a new comprehensive university with a new concept. I personally found all these properties quite favorable. And teaching and research, a new format of teaching and research were quite wonderful. From a faculty point of view, I liked the creation of a school of study. And from a student point of view, I liked the cluster of colleges or the numbered colleges, if you will, it was initially named. So um, the third school was the school I was first assigned to. And then the scope of the third school it was very difficult to explain what the third school really means. And so I really had a personal concern whether this numbered system was easy for people to understand. But either way, separation of teaching and research was something that I really liked about Tsukuba University. So landed on the campus. I realized that the members of the materials engineering department were made up of a very wide variety of people from fields such as chemistry, physics, electrical, electronic engineering, theory, and experimentation. 
experimentation. And I was able to do things that were outside my area of expertise without even having to do joint research. And it has really enriched the scope of my research. It was immediately after the relocation of the national school. And back then, met the Industrial Science Agency of Industrial Science and Technology, which is now called. I believe that the name back then was Senkoken, or the Textile and Polymer Materials Research Institute, and the Electronic Technology Research Institute. All the researchers in these institutes were always available for consultation. Back then, the city of Tsukuba was not fully developed, and many people lacked places to relax, and there were no coffee shops or izakaya bars. But I do not drink. And having a cup of coffee doesn't really make me feel relaxed. So I really liked the environment, really, because I didn't need either of them, be the coffee shop and the bars. And with shorter commuting hours and being freed from jam-packed trains, I really enjoyed being on campus, even though it was a short period of one year in the States, I found Scuba's life just as the one I had in the United States. So I showed you a couple of pictures of Tsukuba campus. In these other pictures, I took when I arrived at Tsukuba. So this is uh, where you enter and you go to towards the north. This is a loop road and you can see Mount Scuba in the back, and it was autumn. So you see the leaves turning yellow. And if you go further north, then you would, I'm not really sure what the name is now, but back then it was called F Building. And I was located, I had my lab located here um, on the fourth floor. And from building F towards the east, I think this is the eastern direction. And I think this was the low temperature center, an accelerator center. And you can see that the leaves have turned red. You also see some yellow leaves, on the ginkgo tree, and it was a beautiful campus. And also, if you look inside the campus, um, there were students riding bikes, um, probably hurrying to go to their classrooms. So this was a daily scene in the campus. Now, so I talked about the very good things that I found, but of course, nothing is all good. Uh, there were a lot of uh, meetings, a lot of conferences. I had to go travel to Tokyo uh, very frequently, and every time... Um, you ha I had to drive to Arakawaoki Station and then park my car there and ride the Joban line to Ueno. And then take the subway or the Yamanote line and travel to my destination. And especially, um, it was quite inconvenient to travel to the central part of Tokyo, but then there was a bus connecting Tokyo and Tsukuba, and then now we have the Tsukuba Express. But that was after I retired, five years after I retired. But um, my memory of my Tsukuba days was that it was very busy. So you have the education organization, the research organization, they were separate. So you have m the meeting for the teaching side, the meeting for the research side. There are two graduate universities. You have the uh, faculty conferences for that. So. You had to take time for these meetings, and therefore they, this hampered my research and education. Um, so I do hope that the university will make effort to resolve this issue. Well, and I, of, I am aware of my time, but when I was 
In elementary school, I think I was eight years old or so, maybe second grade or third grade in 1944 at one time. My younger brother and myself uh, were taken to my grandfather's house my, on my father's side. I had to live there, the Tokyo, uh, the Hongo uh, district, uh, Nishikata town. That was the address, but it's the Bunkyo ward today. Um, the agriculture school of the T University of Tokyo, if you take a left from the gate, you would go to the former Haksan Dori Street. And then if you walk toward the left, then you would find my grandfather's house. Uh, it was a two-story wooden house. And my grandfather loved his grandchildren, so he liked to take walks with his grandchildren. And of course, uh, we would go to the School of Agriculture, um, and also walk towards the main gate of the University of Tokyo and the Red Gate also. And beyond the, the fence, I was able to see the building and also the trees inside the campus of the University of Tokyo. And I thought, how majestic um, is a university? It's so dignified. It's very difficult to uh, get in, and especially the clock tower uh, as a child. Um, I didn't know the word ivory tower, but if I knew that word, I probably would have thought that this is indeed an ivory tower. It's been 80 years since. Uh, nobody would call a university an ivory tower. I believe that it is an ivory tower of sorts because basic science uh, starts from the curiosity of individual researchers. However, that the result will not only contribute to the development of the study or but also to the search of truth, but it is also be will become an uh, a intellectual asset for the whole humankind. So I would like to say that the role of a university is in part to become an ivory tower, a basic research based on a individual curiosity should be done in an ivory tower. Of course, ivory tower is used to express a place that is isolated from the real world or society. But, uh, or, or rather, it's not that, but it is something that, uh, but uh, I do hope that we can call an ivory tower something that will be uh, a place where people pursue their curiosity to seek the truth, uh, although it may not uh, be util useful immediately. And I do hope that a tax money could be utilized for basic science and basic research. But in reality, uh, if you look at the general account expenditure of the government in 2004, it was 84.9 trillion yen. Then in 2022, <coughs> last year, it was 107.6 trillion yen. It has gone up by 27%. However, Back then, in 2004, when national universities became independent uh, organizations, then the operation subsidies from the government has been reduced by one percentage point every year. In 2022, it went down to 87% compared to 2004. So the national uh, Expenditure itself is going up by 27%, but uh, the operation fee for universities is going down by 27%. It should have gone up by 27%. However, it has gone down. So in order to cover up for uh, the shortage, uh, we ha uh, universities have to uh, seek other ways to finance research, getting it from the private sector or selling and transferring technology. And therefore, the university uh, research be is becoming more short-term, something that 
could be useful right away. And basic research is now being neglected. And I believe that universities are really struggling now. Well, then, does it look like from the student's viewpoint? As I've been saying, or as we've been hearing, we have the School of Art and Design, and you have the School of Physical Education at the University of Tsukuba. From the time of being students, you have people who are really active, for example, in Olympics and other athletic fields, and um, that has been taken up by the media. But then what about the other students, the major part of the student body? The graduate school students as well, what can they do for society? And I know that I'm talking for too long, but I have been serving as an assistant for a very long time. My professor um, asked me to uh, teach a lecture uh, in on his part because uh, the professor had to attend a conference overseas or something. So I had to teach one lecture class and thought that I was now becoming a part of the faculty of the university. But when I started to think about what to teach, and as I started to study for my class, no matter how much I study, it was not enough. Teaching is actually learning. You have to learn broadly if you are to teach somebody. That's what I truly felt. So teaching is about learning by yourself. That's what I learned from this experience. And that's what I'd like to tell the students of today. Uh, youth may think that your job is to learn, but please seek opportunities to teach somebody because you will understand the meaning of learning through teaching others. So teaching is all about learning by yourself. And so based on that, I do hope that students will continue to study and learn. And with that, I would like to end my lecture. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Shirakawa, for your lecture. Now, this is a wonderful opportunity. We would like to receive questions to Dr. Shirakawa. If you have any questions, please raise your hand. And uh, when you do, please uh, let us know your uh, affiliation and your name. Anybody, any questions, please? I have a hard time seeing you from here, but uh, over there. I'm uh, Tsukuba, the, the doctors, the third year, Kyoka uh, Mata of uh, the College of Mathematics. I have one question to you. Please go ahead, Dr. Shirakawa. With children in the uh, science activities, I know you uh, give them scientific experimental uh, classes. Any memories that you have in particular from your experiences? Well, in various sense, I learn a lot through those science classes. And I feel that they have very fresh eyes looking at science, those young children. Now, experimental classes is one thing I do, but I also uh, lead uh, uh, nature classes, uh, the five uh, nights, uh, six day. And uh, in Gifu Prefecture in Shirakawa uh, Village near Hakusan Mountain, we had an opportunity for a science class in nature. Then we looked at uh, a stream. I took children there to uh, this very small river, a stream. Then uh, there were some fish. Uh, 
swimming and uh, we've tried to catch this fish. Then we found that the fish called iwana, the color is different, color change. When you're looking at them in dark places, it was uh, light and dark place, it was dark. It didn't seem to be a, a different type of fish. The Japanese char uh, is the name of the fish, but if they're put in the same place, the color was all the, turned to be the same. So the children, uh, made this discovery through their own observation that the fish also change colors. Showing them the true nature would really lead to some very fresh-eyed surprise for children, and those are new discoveries for the children. And uh, that was uh, very impressive for me. That's the fun I have to see the children, if you teach them three days, you will never be able to stop. Thank you very much for the wonderful question and answer. Any other people would like to ask a question? This individual, please. Allow me to ask a question. I'm a master's student. Osaka Hiromi is my name. I am in organic chemistry. What is the attractiveness and charm of this area of study? The reason I was attracted to chemistry was because when the substance transform into another, they become a totally different being. For example, solid becomes a gaseous material. That was something that really intrigued me. Talking of plastics, it's the same. Ethylene is a gaseous, and polyethylene is solid. So transformation and the way they change in properties were something that I found quite exciting. So in the world of science, when one substance transforms into another, Properties also change along with the transformation. And that transformative process is something that I found very attractive. But there are some lessons that I have learned over the years. Plastic was something that was not quite convenient. And that is why I wrote when I was a junior high school student that I want to improve it. And that is why I was went into the field of high polymer. And then plastic is very convenient, easy to use. So we tend to lay persons tend to overuse it because it is very easy. And that is leading to the problem of plastic waste and marine plastics as well, microplastics, for example, are having a, such a negative impact on our life as well. In this regard, that is something that we should have pre prevented. The same is true for physics and any other fields in science. There are collateral damages that should be prevented. And that, I think, is the area and of challenge for future sciences. Thank you. Thank you very much. Perhaps we can entertain one more question. Any questions from the floor, please? The person over there. Thank you very much. I'm uh, from the uh, mathematics, uh, the material science. I'm uh, Miyashita, the second year graduate course. Thank you very much for the pre very precious opportunity to hear from you. When you're studying overseas, when you're doing research overseas, what were the difficulties you have faced? Any situations that was difficult? And how did you overcome the any difficulties that you may have had? Well, working overseas, were there any difficulties? Well, having to speak in English, 
had been the issue. You just have to get used to it. Try as much as possible. Whenever you have an opportunity, uh, you try not to speak Japanese, but listen to English and try to speak in English. Get used to it. I think that's the only way to go through. That was the most difficult part. When it comes to the environment for research activities, that was very comfortable and I enjoyed my research activities a lot. Now, in terms of human relationship, I was uh, able to have people around me who are very straightforward, candid, and with many people from overseas, I was able to have good exchanges and that's been uh, very precious for me. Thank you very much. I'm sure that many of you want to ask more questions, but unfortunately, we need to close the Q&A session. Professor Sh Shirakawa, thank you very much for your insightful discussion. Thank you very much for your close attention. And thank you very much for wonderful questions from the floor as well. With this, I would like to close this commemorative lecture by Professor Shirakawa. Another round of warm applause is in order for Professor Shirakawa. With this commemorative lecture will be closed. Thank you very much again for Professor Shirakawa, Vice President Shigeta, as well as all those of you who asked questions. Thank you very much for your participation. The next segment Adventurous Design the Future will be opening from 3 Sharp. Before that, I would like to show you a video clip. The hall is very dark, so those of you who are using the restroom, please watch your step. Now, there is something very interesting to share with you. Do you have any myth of Tsukuba University or Tsukuba City? I think it is not really a myth, but a fact from Hiratsuna dorm to all the schools, there is an underground tunnel that has been rumored as a future universe, a Japanese government bunker in case of a contingency. And there is another zigzag shaped dorm and that is often dubbed as a mobile suit component that can be combined together. Now, is that really a myth? I also heard some horror stories as well, like female screams in the middle of, in the wee hours. And then there were some of the students who were exp expelled because he or she ate the fish from the pond. Well, there are all those rumors, ungrounded or grounded. And some of the alumni just went to see if all these stories are true. Hi, え、元NHKアナウンサー松尾剛と申します。武田さんと大学同期、青山さんとNHK同期の松尾でございます。えっと、ちょっとした、あの、ナンパのサークルをやっておりますね。何に<笑> その 
話がだいぶマニアックな方向に来てますね。で,<笑>はい、では早速ですがまず最初の疑問はこちらです。地下に第四学軍があるこれはもう開学当時から知ってたんですけど、はい、筑波大学にはあの人間があの楽に入って立って歩くことができる地下の通路が張り巡らされているっていうそういうあの伝説があって、はい、でしかもそこにはあの入ってはいけなくって、はい、入ったら学生が入ったら除籍になるっていう<笑>そういう都市伝説が出ておりました除籍っていうのは厳しく退学よりも厳しい、うん、そうですね入ったちあれが歴史、はい、入学が入学すら消されるっていうことですよねそうなんです学園都市って東と西に東大通り西大通りの片側三車線の非常に幅広い道が通ってる、はい、これも都市伝説かどうかわからないんですけれどもあれは有事には滑走路になる聞いたことあります滑走路になってあそこが飛行機が飛んだり降りたりするんだとそれで有事の説には、はい、あの地下があの通路のところに、はい、そこがあのシェルター兼あの基地となってそれであの日本を守るんだっていうなるほどで、はい、結局その通路って何なんですか電気だとかあのコンピューターネットワークとかそれをあの通すためのあの、えー、まあケーブルとかその類が通ってるっていうそれをメンテナンスしやすく配管とかケーブルとかがあるところってことですね,そうですねあなるほど、えー、いやでも助手席になるのは、うん、学生にとってみれば相当な恐怖ですよねそうなんですよ筑波大学はまだ15単位1年間に取れなかったら助手席、はい、それから6年間であの卒業できなかったら助手席、はい、それから地下に入ったら助手席<笑><笑>学食に計算ロボットを搭載したおばさんがいた、うん、あのおばさんはすごかったですねほご存知ですか、うん、知ってます知ってますあの方はすごくって大きな食堂のあのレジの例にいらっしゃるんですけれどもトレイにいろんな自分が食べたいものをお好みで取ってきて、はいでご飯も大中小っていろいろあるし、はい、あのパターンがたくさんあるわけです、はい、で自分で見てもいくらか分かんないんですね大体<笑>、はい、<笑>いいイメージでやってるんですけど、はい、でおばさんがパッと見て、はい、いくらって言ってくれると瞬時に瞬時に言ってくれるでそれを、えー、と4並列になるわけですねそうですね4並列なので、はい、これあの今の言葉でたまたま私あのコンピューター専門でやってますので、はいはい、あのマルチコア今の CPU ってマルチコアっていうコアが複数なんですけど4コアのプロセッサーを積んだおばさんがいたあれは素晴らしくってでコンピューターの言葉であのスループットっていうんですよ単位時間あたりスループット単位時間あたりに4つの仕事ができるっていうあのおばさんなんですね。4人のそのお客さんに対して「あ,の、えー、あんたはいくらです」って計算を与えるとそれぞれがみんなこれ非同期っていうんですけれどもバラバラにお財布からお金を取り出して<笑>、はい、それでお金を出してっていうので、はいえー、非同期処理ができる四個おばさんっていう。<笑>そういうおばさんがいたおかげで、長い行列も、うん、あの順調にはけていくてい。そういうおばさんでございます。早いって,言って。最初学生も自分でいくらとかって考えて、小銭とか用意しようとするんですけど。おばちゃんの方が絶対勝ってしまうので、もう本当一別しただけでいくらっていうふうにパッと言うので。この辺までなる、もう。だいたいこの辺までいつも並んでました。だいたいいつも、この辺に立ってまして。なんか計算はしてないと思うんですね。もうパッと見て多分頭の中でその数字が浮かぶっていうような感じで。あったあった。これ中島八子さん。こんにちは。お願いします。はい、大塚です。よろしくお願いします。どうして早いんですかって聞いたら、いやもう全部暗記してるから。暗記ですか。いや、計算じゃなくてなんだろうと思ったときに、やっぱりあの心理学勉強してたので、あの私たち漢字を見て、その漢字が何かってパッとわかるじゃないですか。例えば大きい。点がついたら犬パッとその意味って浮かぶじゃないですかそれと同じことなんじゃないかなっていうふうに僕は解釈したんですけどプロだと思いましたね
プロフェッショナルだって、はい、学生のためにですよ言ってみれば学生のためにですよ大の大人というかねこれだけの方が昼も夜もおそらく休日も頭の中でずっと練習してると思うんですよ。うん、ありえない組み合わせとかも多分納豆納豆納豆とかも多分練習してたと思うんですよ。あもうこれは絶対記事にしなきゃって思いましたあのこれは絶対風図風だって思いましたあの肩書きとかスポーツで活躍したとか学業でこういう成績を収めたとかじゃだけじゃないよって絶対うちの大学はこういうパーソンがいるんだっていうのをすごい思ったんですよ。瞬時でこの方のこのかお顔を思い出しましたメガネの色まで。上がねグラデーションかかってて、はい、上が多分茶色で下が薄いグラデーションかかってる目がねこれ白黒だからそこまでは分からないわかんないでしょ、はい、寝る前に暗記の練習をしてたらしいです、うん、胸打ちますね胸打ちますね<笑>そうですよねいやそこまでそこまでやってあの技が出てたんだと思うとですねプロフェッショナルですよねいやすごいあのそれをさも自然にやるんですよこれがまたさりげなくお願いしますでも本当に周りに何もないような時代でもう職をこうたしなむというと学食しかなかったんじゃないかと思うんですね学生が何て言うんですかあそこに150席ぐらいしかなかったんですがそうですそうです、はい、その当時はですねそこの椅子に8回転ぐらいしてましたから、まあ、1200ですかね。ほうほう今物価上がってますけどその辺は大丈夫ですか大変です大変ですもうこれはですねもう今利用していただいているお客さんに本当に負担していただくしかないんですまあこれから提供する献立も厳しいんですけれどもまあそれよりも何しろやはりそういうことをまあ利用していただく方に理解いただいてやはりこの福利厚生の学食がですね維持できる協力もそこでしていただかなきゃいけないなと私は思ってるんですね学生時代の若い頃の元気な顔が感じます。元気でね、皆さん。はい、さようなら。ご自身でおめでとうございます。どうもおめでとうございました。では武田さん、青山さんお返しします。いやーびっくりしました。松尾くんが急に出てきて、本当ね全く知らされてませんでしたね。いや知らなかったです。<笑> well, we are really surprised to see our former colleague on the video during the break time. And、uh, he graduated from the university, and、uh, he was 27 when he joined the Broadcasting Corporation NHK. We r e all surprised to hear that, but、uh, it's been really a first time in a long time. And、uh, we visited those restaurants that、uh, were shown on the video, but I can really see that. The, and also, the people in the cafeteria, many people have、uh, supported us, and now we are celebrating the 50th year、uh, in celebration because of the support of all these people. You must have seen the photos 50 years ago, Tsukuba University was surrounded by almost wilderness. Dr. Shirakawa showed you some pictures earlier, and、uh, really reminded me of old days because we are all on bicycles. Now, 
there is nothing around us, but then we created something new that were very different from other universities. And that was the intention of the, the university and all the students who gathered at Atsukuba had been full of frontier spirits and that challenging something new indeed is adventure. Now, the key word for the next part of the meeting is adventure. And uh, we would like to ask uh, the alumni or the graduates to ask about adventure. For, uh, for you, what was the greatest adventure for you, Aoyama-san? Well, I had many failures, but when I was in Atsukuba, I started to live on our own outside of my home. That was an adventure. Did it have a major impact on your subsequent lives? Well, big impact. Well, we were at the same dormitory, right? I was in dorm one, you two, right? I always wanted to live uh, on my own, but we had to share bathrooms and toilets, and we didn't even have telephones in our rooms. And I didn't know to use carpet. So the linoleum uh, floor uh, was uh, common, but everybody else had carpets on the the wallpapers peeled off, so I had to put in put on some posters, and the the phones. You had to be in line to make phone calls, and I made my phone call to my mother and asking her for some cooking instructions. You are from Hiroshima, that's correct. My parents are from Hiroshima, and phone bills were really expensive back in those days. Correct. But we all we shared practically everything. We took the same bath. We ate in the same cafeteria. We had many international students. And because I had many friends, I was able to enjoy the environment. And I developed interest in foreign countries because of the international students. So my adventure led me to have broader perspectives. What was the adventure for you? Right. In Tsukuba, I lived uh, on my own for the first time, and then I worked very hard. I uh, had my family. I tried very hard for everything, but my attitude was developed in four years in Tsukuba because I felt loneliness when I was here. I was really lonely when I was here. I felt that I was very small, powerless, but then at the same time, I had many friends who helped me a lot. I was able to trust people. I could have ambitions, uh, the will to succeed, and loneliness. It really is the origin of myself, right? We recognize that we are all very small and tiny, right? That's because the University of Cuba was big. Well, now, the current students who must be feeling loneliness right now, I'd like them to join us. Welcome. We have with us two incumbent students in undergraduate program. I'm Aoi Oguri, a student of College of Social Science. It is a great opportunity for me to talk to you in such a large hall. I'll do my best. Thank you very much. You don't look as if you're nervous. You don't look nervous at all. I am. I'm senior of College of Comparative Culture. My name is Junta Amano. I'm the senior, so I only have several months to go. I feel lonely about leaving the campus, but I'll do my best as well. And I understand that you have good a position in a TV industry. Yes, I'll work as a TV director and work for program production. Good luck. Well, TV industry is not necessarily a lucrative industry going forward, but please revitalize the industry. Now, let's look back on the lives of students and alumni. What is adventure when uh did you think you wanted to play overseas well i watched uh, japan south korea world cup games and then i uh, joined soccer team and then started watching international games and uh, i watched uh, the coaches and managers 
that was really the beginning. And uh, since I joined the professional teams, I became really meticulous developing my routine for work. I started to be able to choose what is right and wrong, whether I should continue certain activities or not. I did uh, fail a lot. Uh, and uh, through the experiences I have learned. Well, in the future, I would like to be able to play on the top level of sports in Europe. So while I keep my physical strengths, I'd like to continue to play in Europe. And by staying in the games, the athletes can show our value. I would like to be on the top league and also there will be a World Cup games in three years time. I hope to, to be able to show my fans the wonderful scene of victory. I'm 26 years old now and I feel that my prime time will be until I'm in the first half of 30s. So my top value will probably last for the next 10 years what I'll be able to do, what I'll be able to bring, that will be the key. And maybe through the World Cup games and also through get regular activities with my club, I hope to always show the results. And when I retire, I would like to have no regrets. Well, if I can go back to when I was 18, I'm sure I would have chosen to be a professional right away because uh, I would certainly choose other ways. Of course, it was good to be at Tsukuba. I can say that because I was at Tsukuba, but there's only one life. So if I had a choice of different lives, I would go for the uh, uh, professional. Hello, I am Takanori Nagase, class of 2015. I was a student of the College of Physical Education and was a member of the Judo Club. After graduation, I joined Asahi Kasei Corporation and continue to pursue Judo to this day. I would like to extend my heartfelt congratulations on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the university's establishment. The greatest, the greatest adventure of my life was undoubtedly when I embarked in 2017 on a solo overseas martial art training journey. Over the course of about one month, I engaged in judo training in European powerhouse nations, deepened my connections with foreign athletes, and had the opportunity to immerse myself in various cultures. The reason I decided to challenge myself abroad alone was my defeat at the 2016 Rio Olympic Games that maybe made me recognize my weaknesses. I wanted to grow as an individual. I not only handled the logistics of the trouble, but also managed my daily life entirely on my own while overseas. Through this experience, I was able to strengthen not only my athletic abilities, but also my inner self. In the midst of solitary moments, in an unfamiliar environment, I decided myself wholeheartedly to judo and developed a strong resolve for the future. The experiences and lessons I had during my time at the University of Scuba provided a strong foundation for me to embark on this adventure. In classes at Scuba, I studied the human body structure, gained knowledge in training techniques, and acquired foreign language skills. These skills directly contributed to improving my athletic abilities and language proficiency. Through activities in the judo club, I honed my ability to identify and solve real world challenges. I also dedicated time outside of practice to self-directed training, following carefully planned routines. Another strength of Scuba University is the size of its international students and athletes. Scuba allowed me to interact with people from around the world year round on campus. Through these interactions, I learned how to communicate effectively and broaden my cultural horizons, expanding my worldview. In view of the knowledge and experiences I gained at the university, 
as valuable assets in my life, and I hope to continue applying them to shape my future. Congratulations again on this special day. So people who are active on the international arena, I think it, it gives you great stimulation. So Mitoma, uh, Kaoru Mitoma, during the um, World Cup uh, in Hong Kong, he was a hot topic. Uh, I understand that when he was a student, he'd put a small camera on his head and he kicked the ball around and he tried to look at where the opponent was looking at when they tried to get the ball from him. So he brought in a scientific perspective into sports. And I was really impressed. And also, Takanori Nagase at the Tokyo Olympic Games for the 81 kilogram class in judo, he got the gold medal. So a gold medalist can choose to uh, paint the uh, post box into gold and Nagase actually chose a post box right in front of the Tsukuba University uh, post office and uh, painted that gold. So the 81 kilogram class is a class which was very difficult for Japanese judoists to win, but uh, he utilized data um, in order to come up with his strategy to win. So there are many sports athletes uh, that come from uh, University of Tsukuba and now Amano-san, are you ready? Yes, I'm here. So take it away. Yes, um, here we have uh, Kozo Tashima, the chairman of the Japan Football Association or the president of the Japan Football Association. So Mr. Tajima, uh, you have just seen uh, Mi Mr. Mitoma um, in the video. Uh, can you give us some comments? Well, I have been watching him since he was a student and he's becoming a bigger athlete and I'm, I really enjoy watching him perform. And I think he has his eyes on the international arena, therefore I'm really expecting a lot from him. Now, Mr. Tashima, for yourself, what does adventure mean to you? Did you have any adventures? And is that adventure linked to your student days at University of Tsukuba? Well, my adventure was coming to Tsukuba. And after I graduated from the uh, graduate school, uh, going abroad to Germany was also um, an adventure for me. It's not an adventure like uh, following the train tracks or a path, but it's like a voyage on the great fast sea. And I have been involved in Japan Football Association for about 20 years. Um, this, is, this has been an, an adventurous travel. And I want to continue to communicate uh, to the athletes that you are one day going to seek becoming world champions. Thank you very much. Well, actually, I am wearing this um, necktie. Which, th this is also from the Tsukuba University, uh, of the soccer team. Well, um, I'm not from the soccer team itself, but I'm wearing this um, necktie to cheer for the soccer team. And also on the stage here, I believe some of you have already noticed, but from SoftBank Hawks, uh, the manager, Mr. Kimiyasu Kudo, is up here. Uh, he has graduated, or rather, uh, he has um, finished uh, the master's course, and right now he's taking a doctoral course. And also, we have Professor Hitoshi Shiraki from sports medicine. So, um, I think, Oguri-san, you will be moderating this part. Um, so, uh, I believe that uh, you have had 224 wins um, from 2015 to 2021. Um, you were a manager at the Fukuoka SoftBanks and you led the team to becoming uh, number one in Japan for five times. And you have been playing as a professional baseball player for 29 years. 
and you have focused on managing your body, managing your health. And in 2014, uh, because you wanted to study sports medicine, you have um, entered the graduate school at Tsukuba. And I think it was a great challenging adventure to jump into the sports medicine scene from professional baseball. And also Professor Shiraki has been dealing with not just Mr. Kudo, but also Shingo Katayama from professional golf and also speed skater Hiroyasu Shimizu. I, so you know uh, Mr. Kudo since uh, he was a professional uh, player. Uh, so I'd like you to, uh, I am looking forward to speaking to both of you. Thank you very much. It's been a long time I'm seeing you. Thank you for the introduction. I'm Shiraki Aoyama-san. Yes, it's be, really been a long time. She's a graduate from the sports sciences. And I think you were working for Nagano, right? Yes, in NHK, Nagano was the first uh, uh, place I worked for Olympics. And uh, I wasn't really a good student uh, when I was in your class, and I'm really tense and nervous. And Mr. Kudo, well, your player, uh, you had been very active, and uh, you, I uh, had an, a lot of uh, interviews with you. But thank you. May I start? Well, thank you very much. I would like to be a moderator or interviewer. Uh, there are players, but uh, I have rarely called him Kudo-san. It's kind of hard for me to call, but for more than 20 years, maybe 30 years, right, it's been 30 years. For the physical management, I had been responsible for him. Now through, we had that uh, experience and after he retired, he wanted to study the human bodies. That's why he came to Tsukuba. And now he is in uh, the, the bachelor's course. And then he became the uh, manager of the uh, SoftBank, Fukuoka SoftBank. And you know how active he had been. Now you're in agriculture, correct? Right, I'm challenging the agricultural studies. I know you have spoken at the various different opportunities. And uh, you are in agricultural activities together with the uh, students in doctor course. But perhaps I shouldn't get into too much depth. So I should ask more about the university to you. Now, after you retired the baseball and now you're studying sports medicine. Now it must have been an adventure jumping from the field of baseball into academics. What had been an adventure for you? Well, when I was a player, before I really learned a lot, I thought I've challenged a lot and learned a lot. But then I thought maybe what I was doing was not right. And now that I'm in the university uh, as a student, I think I have tried, I've gained a lot of answers to my questions. I like to see, I like to uh, hear and uh, uh, learn. Eventually it comes to hoping to learn more. And that's been my adventure. Now that I'm in the Tsukuba University, I am finding some answers to my questions and I'm learning a lot more that I didn't know. So when I became the baseball manager, I was able to learn a lot too. Well, now that in your graduate school, you must be taking various different courses. What specifically had been different from your previous life or what had been very useful for you? Well, reading, learning by reading books, or just studying on my own didn't really tell me what exactly certain things were. But now that I have my teacher professors explaining me what they were, I was able to clarify uh, the, what I had uh, learned, have better idea of what I learned. Then when I had questions, I could ask the, uh, the, the professors, the faculty, they did give me answers. So whenever I had questions, things that I did not understand, I did not know, now I can I have answers, I have good answers with good understanding. Well, we are in sports medicine, 
uh, the research laboratory which you joined, and I thought you would uh, be more interested in coaching uh, skills, but why sports medicine? Well, now that I'm in the graduate school, I thought that uh, the uh, prevention of injury was important, not really for professional, but for children when they have uh, suffer injur injuries or suffer a lot of pains playing baseball. That's something that should not happen. I've always thought that. So I didn't know how much I could be involved in this, but prevention of injuries is something I wanted to learn thoroughly, and I wanted to pass that information on to the people in baseball so that I can make a contribution for the future of the children. Well, for children, you said, in various different locations, there are baseball classes, baseball courses that you are uh, running through this, what were the experiences? What did you think? And and your learnings from a school, university, what you, did you think was most useful for the children? Well, we had been in the active uh, baseball. What uh, we teach children in those baseball courses is how the people should move, behave. And that's not that difficult. But when talking to the managers or the parents of the children, uh, my having experience in universities, getting a lot of knowledge and data, that was very helpful as I had to explain to the parents and the coaches and managers. Now, injuries for children. It's very important that uh, not just children, but the leaders, the, the coaches and parents to understand what is necessary to prevent injuries. And uh, through this knowledge, you can prevent a lot of them. Therefore, I have those uh, baseball uh, lessons and I try to secure some time to talk to the parents and other adults involved in the children's baseball. That should be helpful in preventing injuries. Well, in fact, through those baseball lessons, you guide the children, but on a slightly different topic. You were a professional baseball player for 29 years, and then you became an, an academician. Now, within the arena of sports, you always hear that you can achieve as long as you have strong mentalities, the spirits, those are, uh, consi are considered very important. But then on the other hand, in school, you are learning science of sports. How do you think you can merge them? Well, the, the spiritualities and the mental strengths had been the kudo for me as I became a player. The, I'm not saying they're not necessary, but uh, while knowing about the spiritualities and mentalities, you should also learn the scientific aspect because then you know uh, what are the realities, what uh, yeah, can be done. Uh, experiences are more important than anything. And just because certain things are difficult, it doesn't mean it's bad. If you want to be a top player or a top person in anything, you need to bear through uh, the hardships and difficulties through this. Your uh, the mental strengths uh, could be enhanced and that will lead to the outcome. Well, we live in the world of sports, but for prof professional sports persons, use of data as you guide uh, your disciples, the, the athletes. When I was in the graduate school, and uh, the, I, the, there is a, a book, Prom Prometheus, uh, for anatomy. It's uh, 20,000 uh, yen per book, but you bought those books yourselves and gave to the uh, baseball coaches. Now, between data and giving guidance, you would like to make contributions to be useful. Now, what are the reasons why you thought that you would like to make contributions? Well, with ignorance or without having knowledge or not keeping the rules, uh, which is common in baseball, led to the problems. I think it's uh, the responsibility of coaches and managers to 
know what needs to be communicated to the players. Therefore, I wanted them uh, to learn uh, from the human anatomy, the, the, the so that's why I gave the, the anatomy book to the coaches and that's the seven years. Nobody read through the book, I know. But uh, maybe not now, but sometime in the future, people will be able to recognize that it's very important to have uh, the data, know the anatomy. Uh, maybe not in the current generation, but maybe in the future generation, or they, when uh, they have the necessity, they will learn, and what they have on hand will not be used, uh, be of waste. You can uh, use Trackman and others to generate data eventually for uh, a tuning conditioning for the players, uh, or uh, eventually leading to the victory by the sport, by, a, by the teams, it must have contributed, so it's worth it. In reality, I remember passing him that anatomy book to him, I don't know whether he read it or not, but the scientific knowledge, such as offered by Tsukuba in sports medicine, using the knowledge developed in academia to be used in the actual field of sports is meaning would be meaningful. Now, Mr. Kudo, your theme of uh, research was the use of TrackMan for measurements and uh, for your doctor's theory, it was to protect uh, children's shoulders and elbows, uh, especially in the bachelor's course, what you have uh, uh, research done as a research was quite interesting. So how do you think you can make that knowledge applied into the actual uh, baseball activities? Well, my uh, the bachelor's page was used of Dragman to for the improvement of condition, conditions of the uh, the players, when uh, they run all nine innings, how would their physique change? And uh, through the change, how do you change uh, the, the, the switch the pitchers? The timing to switch the pitchers is most difficult, but having the data, you will know when, but you won't have the data available until the subsequent day. So people may think it's, it's of no use, but that's not the case because you will learn to observe the pitchers very well. How do, the, do, the, do their forms change? When should you switch the players? By developing your good eyes to be able to make judgments, you can reduce injuries of the players. And that information may be applied to children. So they are able to throw limited number of balls in a game. By introducing those measures, we can stop you can intervene so children will not suffer injury, injuries, but when to intervene is the knowledge you could gain from the studies. Thank you very much. That was a really uh, good student answer. Now, use of science is not really uh, common among the people actually in the field. I hope, uh, uh, well, there are very few researchers who engage in research activities and try to apply that knowledge in the field. My, my last question, in, now you're still in the academia, university. Now, as you continue to learn science, uh, you will want to share uh, your knowledge or information to the people out in the baseball uh, arena or in sports in general. What would you like to, how would you like to uh, contribute uh, for the sports in general? What are the challenges you would like to make in order to do so? Well, adventure is uh, something that uh, when you want to try to see or learn and uh, hear the area of interest, when you have your own interest, you could be positive for looking, willing to learn what you do not know. And in order to find answers to my questions, whenever I am in doubt, I would like to try to challenge something new. So I have yet to learn a lot, 
uh, have a lot I still do not know about. So through the uh, baseball, and because I am a, a person of baseball, in order to create future for children, I'd like to try to challenge something new, agriculture, uh, building houses. I'll try many things, but for now, the, the my priority is to ensure a bright future for the baseball, for children in the future, and I hope to make contributions as I do. Well, I know the time is limited, but uh, uh, I was able to hear interview Mr. Uh, Kimiyasu Kudo uh, about his learning experiences at Tsukuba. He must have learned a lot throughout, and uh, now you are in the doctorate course. Now, one mission of Tsukuba is that you're uh, capable uh, you to develop researchers both in the uh, aspect of humanities and uh, uh, the sports. So for those people who would like to become a professional sports athlete and also a scholar, Tsukuba has its door wide open to them. We'll see many more people like Mr. Kudo. Well, he is a professional with so much achievements, now willing to learn. So indeed, he is achieving both the humanities and sports in a dual objectives. This could be baseball, any sports, sports activities around the world, or it could be any type of culture. He is going to be a very stimulating president. Mr. Kudo is still a student uh in a uh, graduate school so he is a student however he's equipped with both skills in humanities and the uh, the sports it is the the first pitcher but i don't think he has thrown any balls so as a starting pitcher he would uh, like to continue to stimulate people in all other uh, uh throughout the world and complete your pitch it should be a perfect pitch. Once you start to pitch, you need to achieve a perfect pitch. Correct. Let me speak in 30 seconds. I I wasn't aware that he played in Koshien. And I think I am the only person in the world who asked this question. And he also made a no hit, no run perfect game on Koshien Stadium when he was in high school. So I really hope that we should be having more athletes like Mr. Kudo in the sports field as well. With this, I would like to close this session. Thank you very much again for all the inspiring talk, Mr. Kudo. Thank you too. Thank you very much, Mr. Kudo. And thank you, Professor Shiraki. As a mother who of two who are playing soccer and tennis each, I just thought that I should be being a better trainer for my children as well, because that is something that I learned when I was in college. But anyway, best of wishes to your brighter future for a perfect game and sports. Thank you. Now, who is coming up next? You have seen lots of nice video clips and visual presentation. Associate Professor Ochiya Yoichi will be giving us a video message. Hello, everyone. I am Head Ochiya Yoichi, who graduated from 2012, and I'm currently heading the R&D Center for Digital Nature. For the ceremony, my students and myself are working together to create the ceremony as well as to do make stages. And it's been a great source of fun being involved in this program. On this commemorative situation, I have been able to relearn the connections between the people. And I am very happy that as a person in the field of computer art and media artists, I I'm happy to see that interdisciplinary development of these area of sciences. And I also hope 
to have a brighter future and make whatever contribution I can make. We have lots of alumni in media art, including Ishihara san and others, and Kawaguchi Uchiro san too. I think he was an alumni of Tokyo University of Education. But all these people who are in the area of media art is a testament to the rich history of media art education of University of Tsukuba. And I would like to offer my best of luck for the future of Tsukuba University. And I will be on the backstage during the ceremony today adjusting the audio and visual presentations. Please enjoy the program. Thank you very much, Professor Ochai. Oh, he is waving his hand in the adjustment room right there. He's right over there. Now, chat GPT is a buzzword. It is generative AI having a great impact on society. And digital engineers needs to be developed in Japan as well. One of the next project to enhance the function of higher education for digital talent development has designated University of Tsukuba as the center of such endeavor. Also, approved program for mathematics, data science, and AI smart higher education, or liter literacy plus, also designated University of Tsukuba as the stakeholder of this project. And these are the background of University of Tsukuba, but unlike other universities, informatics has been at the center of informatic engineering. An information processing education has been offered as the undergraduate as well. And there are also other schools in science and humanities, as well as uh, PEs and so on, including media arts. And all these students receive informatic education. Fourth run is the language that I had to study when I was in undergraduate, even though I do not even remember a piece of any grammar of that language. But either way, computer history, development of computer, history of the development of computer is in line with the development of University of Tsukuba as well. Spearhead technologies and research and development has been at the heart of University of Tsukuba demonstrating the spirit of adventure of University of Tsukuba. Thanks to that background, we have also, Tsukuba University has given birth to a wonderful computer scientist, Takeda-san. May I intervene? Here we have with us an alumni of Tsukuba University and a faculty member of Tsukuba. I would like to ask him some questions. Do you have anything about Matsumoto-san? Yukihiro Matsumoto is a world-known engin computer engineer with a nickname, Mats. And I didn't know that he was an alumni of University of Tsukuba. I really look forward to listening to his talk this afternoon. Thank you. So, he is very famous, not only among the Tsukuba alumni, but today we have School of Information Science visiting Professor Dayu Nobori and Matsumoto-san will be having a discussion. Nobori-san and Matsumoto-san shall be introduced by Oguri-san. Yukihiro Matsumoto graduated from the School of Information Science, and in 1993, he developed the language Ruby for computer science. With his, the number of wonderful language is limited, but Ruby is the native computer programming language from Japan. It is a language that allows to develop programs and tabalog, and former Twitter and tab, uh, Cookpad use Ruby as their programming language. 20, in 2003, he entered the University of 
Tsukuba, and he has been designated as the super creator. And the soft ether VPN is being utilized around the world. And also, he developed a remote work system for local governments under the emergency declaration uh, period after COVID. So uh, please, the floor is yours. So thank you very much, Mat Mats, Matsumoto-san. And you are very busy, but thank you very much for coming to this university. This is a very rare, rare opportunity, so I'd like to pose a lot of questions. Well, rather than saying I'm busy, I'm actually living in Shimane Prefecture, so the travel was quite long distance. It's very difficult to travel all the way to Tsukuba. So the programming language, Ruby, um, in 2003, um, when I entered university, it was already very famous and everybody knew this. And I think in 2004, um, we had a special lecture by Mr. Matsumoto, and that's more 20 years ago. But even before that, 20 years before that, I think it was the 10th year uh, when the College of uh, you, uh, you were studying. Um, Ruby, but in I think it was 1995 that you started to develop Ruby. But Ruby, you developed after you entered a company. Is it that you decided to make a programming language after you uh, entered a company, or were you thinking about that from your student days? Well. In high school, or rather, uh, when, when I was in junior high school, I started programming. I was interested in programming languages. And so I thought a lot about it. I studied myself, and I wanted to create a programming language on, uh, of my own. But back then, um, in the 1980s, it's early 1980s, there were no internet back then. Um, the information that, could, that I could get was uh, very limited, and there were no PCs at home. So I couldn't create a programming language. But then I came to Tsukuba University. I started to learn computer language up in Professor Nakata. Um, I entered his lab, and I learned about programming language. And then after that, after I graduated, I became a programmer. And after several ye years, um, after I gained my skills and some more knowledge, um, and based on what I've learned during university, and, and the timing was just right for me at work. So alongside working in the company, well, I um, t stole some time. Um, the company that I used to work uh, back then that doesn't exist anymore, so I think I can say this. Uh, but So I started to uh, develop um, what became Ruby, Ruby after that. So... The initial Ruby uh, source code, I actually read the source code, initial source code. The, so Twitter uh, also was made based on Ruby. Ruby um, programmers, actually, when they do this programming, of course, if to program, you have to use some programming language, and that language is developed by somebody. And I believe that you are one of the top-level language developers. Well, I'm not really sure if I'm top-level or not, but yes, uh, it is a programming language that many people use. So then the basis of applied science, of the engineering I think uh, the programming language is really the basis of all these things. And so you were interested in these systems, but uh, I don't think many students in the College of Information Science would uh, um, become interested in that. So what, what triggered you to learn about that? Well, I was interested in programming languages from my high school days, and I don't really remember very well, but back then, um, BASIC was the programming language uh, which I used. But I was quite frustrated because BASIC uh, is quite an ancient programming language. Um, there were no uh, fancy features that's convenient nowadays. But And I bought a book at the bookstore, and I read about other programming languages. And I thought, oh, there are people who feel the same way as I do. And there are resolutions to the trouble that I'm facing. And there were many different program languages which were made by somebody. And then I thought that I started thinking that maybe I can make a programming language. 
So I was 17 or 18 years old, and that's when I came up with the idea. But I was uh, living in a small town in Tottori, um, and there was nobody that I could talk about these things. So um, I came to Tsukuba University in order to learn about uh, computer science, and then my pr um, classmates were uh, truly interested in programming language. Of course, they were, came to the College of Information Science. They should be interested. But, uh, and there were people who uh, came up with a game software, and they were selling it to uh, these uh, game uh, journals. And so there were these people who I admired in my, as my classmates. And I thought that there were many programmers around me. And when I talked about myself, I said that I want to make a programming language. When I said that, everybody was like, huh? Because programming language is something that already exists. You learn that and you use that to make programs. There was nobody who had the idea of making a programming language anew. Um, there was just one exception among my classmates, and I am still friends with that person. But and looking back, what I like, uh, the program language uh, and computers, uh, you can use that to control the computers. And also, it's like um, human engineering or psychology and language, um, the natural language that we speak. I was interested in that as well. And uh, at the very center was the programming language. So uh, it was easy for me to keep my motivation, and I think uh, that's the theme that I'm pursuing in my life. So you had that kind of idea, you had that motivation. And so Professor Nakata you mentioned about, um, who taught you programming, uh, and w did you uh, take up programming language as a um, your thesis? Well, I'm hoping that nobody would find my uh, thesis, but yes, I made a programming language. And uh, the Nanakata lab was uh, looking at the compiler skills, uh, the, the support tools for compilers. And the programming language itself um, was not the focus of the lab. But I asked my professor, and I talked about what kind of programming language that I wanted to develop. And he said, OK, go ahead. And because of that, I was able to make a programming language, and I was able to graduate uh, by putting that in my thesis. So within the third cluster of colleges, wh where were you? Uh, it was 3E, um, class 302 or something. So the F building, uh, right next to that. Yes, it's the three-story building, or was it a four-story building? Um, F building is um, much taller. And so 40 years ago, uh, there was somebody like a god of programming languages. Well, um, I, I, you make me feel embarrassed by talking about that. But well, Flex, Bison, uh, Utility, um, the compilers, uh, we didn't have the internet back that then. So it, it was very difficult to acquire these things. How did you do that? Well, back then, there were two ways. Um, after I graduated from university, uh, there was this magnetic tape uh, that which looks like a cassette tape. And there were free softwares and source codes, the free ones, and then you send it to an, the next place, and then you copy it, and then after that, um, you send it along, um, and then you send it by mail uh, to the next person who wants to use it. So that's the way we shared that. And how did you get, uh, how do you acquire that? Well, uh, usually we got it from universities like uh, the University of Tokyo, um, and they start to circulate these magnetic tapes. Um, and then you um, say that, yes, I want to copy that. And then somebody uh, comes up with this relay of, of mails to send the tape along. And toward the end, um, it's not the World Wide Web, but um, there was something like an, an internet. There was a net news and also um, um, emails uh, started. And so using that, um, we started to circulate uh, these free softwares. I'm very sorry. I'm talking about ancient times. Well, now, uh, when you came up with Ruby, I believe that um, internet was already coming along. 
Well, the first version of Ruby, um, it was circulated through net news. And then after that, the World Wide Web um, started to flourish. And so after that, um, I we started up a web page uh, to introduce that. And um, we indicated where you could get the source code. I think, I don't remember if it was the web or the FTP, but um, in any case, we... Uh, published it through the through the web and your boss um, at the workplace did you did you get understanding from your boss well I kept it a secret because when I made Ruby it was right after the bubble economy collapsed and the software development uh, company uh, it was a company and, and many projects actually collapsed uh, because of the collapse of the bubble. And so our development team um, had to be dissolved, and we were told that we had to gain profit somewhere through business. And so you are going to go to maintenance, I was told. And we couldn't um, do any new developments. Well, s sometimes um, I would receive calls asking about some um, bugs in uh, the software that we have developed, and we said that you should just shut the computer down and reboot it again. But you, of course, you had the personal computer in front of me, and the manager was looking at several different people and several different divisions, and they weren't supervising me directly, so I thought that I might use my time to come up with something. So it, since your student days, it seems that you were working on your own voluntarily. Well, yes, rather than working by, uh, by um, following some instructions, I think I just uh, pursued my passion. Well, finally, the theme... Um, in the birth of Ruby, what was the biggest adventure that you faced in the development? Well, I think somebody else said it, but the biggest adventure for me was coming to Tsukuba. Um, it was 1984, I think it was just 10 years or so after um, the opening of the university. I think I am the eighth year student, um, so this place was quite empty and Coming to this new university was a big adventure for me. There were two reasons why I chose Tsukuba. Um, one is because I wanted to pursue computer science, not electric or um, um, electrons, but uh, and the other side is uh, because of the Tsukuba Expo. And yes, I ha enjoyed the Tsukuba Expo. And and I. I'm not really an ambitious type of person, but maybe studying abroad to study and um, learn in English. Or I entered a company and became a programmer right after graduation. So maybe I, I sometimes wish that I should have gone up to graduate school. Um, I miss that adventure. But thank you very much. Um, 20 years ago, um, I was inspired by you, and I decided to study computer. And then 20 years from then, um, I believe now I will have to nurture the next generation like I was inspired by you. Well, if many people here will probably be watching what you are doing. I believe you should be sitting here, and I should be interviewing you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. That was really interesting. We enjoyed it. Matsumoto-san, you graduated in 1990, means we graduated in the same year Right, but I had uh, taken some years off, so but maybe we were together in the la my last uh, uh, two years. Right, we are probably uh, several hundred uh, meters apart at the same time. Well, at the same time, such wonderful world of computing was uh, developed, and I uh, may have met you, I, we may have dined together in the cafeteria. That's quite impressive. Thank you very much. Enjoy me to thank them once again. Significantly impact my career as an academician and as an administrator. The experience I had while taking up my degree under the university's 
Doctor of Philosophy in Science, became a stepping stone to my career, successes, and achievements. I was a Mumbu Gakusho scholarship student. I learned so much in the research-intensive learning environment of the university. I also learned the rich Japanese values, which shape who I am today and help me become a visionary leader. The value of time impacts my personal life and my work ethic. I learned this value during my stay at the university. And up until today, I carry it with me. And I encourage my constituents in the Davao del Norte State College to honor the time of others since it is of the essence. It makes us more productive as well. My university experience also taught me to think about others. This value is something I am grateful for since this has become one of my core values in how I lead the Davao del Norte State College as president. I make sure that the institution's employees are happy with their work. I believe happy employees are productive employees. There is more learning I can share. And I can say the university with its high regard for quality education did not just equip me with the necessary skills and knowledge I need with the graduate school degree I have, I was equipped with the essential values that made me a better person, a better professional, academician, and a government worker. My respect to the University of Tsukuba. Congratulations and domo arigato gozaimasu. Thank you. My name is Teruhiko Takagi. I graduated with a degree in social science in 1991. Currently, I work as an aircraft captain at Air Japan Corporation. As to what it was like when I served as the captain of a chartered plane carrying members of the imperial family, since it was a chartered flight, I did feel a bit nervous, but I remember that I, we conducted the flight just as any other routine flight. As to how my education at Scuba University been applied to my career afterward, I believe that my education at Scuba University has provided me with a certain mindset. When I find something interesting or intriguing, I try it out. You would never know what it is like until you try it. Be it my job or in life, in general, I think it is better to take a step forward when you feel something is interesting or worth pursuing. Talking of adventures, looking back, I actually think my student life at the University of Tsukuba was an adventure. Arriving at a new place, making new friends, exploring new places, and discovering new things. All these made my days on campus. It eventually led me to go to Australia to play rugby. And I also studied various subjects like English, which allowed me to build the career I have now. So I believe that my life at Scuba University was the beginning of an adventure for me. Well, Mr. Takagi, actually, we were in the same years in the social studies uh, course. I'm surprised. He looked like he would be the captain. He was uh, really cool. Uh, he wasn't a uh, uh, very smiling type. But it seems like every, for everybody, coming to Tsukuba is an adventure, like scenario. That's what everybody said. It's, it's unplanned, but it seems like everybody agrees that Tsukuba is an adventure. Well, actually, uh, Captain Takagi is here with us. It's a long time no see. 
Currently, uh, Mr. Takagi is working for Air Japan Corporation. 1991, he graduated from the School of Social Sciences, joined All Nippon Airways, and became a, a, a pilot. And when the, uh, the current Emperor Emeritus and Empress visited Palau in April 10, 2015, he was the pilot of the chartered airplane. It was the first time All Nippon Airway uh, received as a request from the royal family. He was in Group B for rugby in school. He studied in Australia and he learned English. And that's been very helpful at Air Japan Corporation. Mr. Takagi. Could you uh, please have some talk with Takeda-san? Well, it must be difficult for you to have to ask questions. Well, actually, we did have some uh, exchanges via email, and uh, you said you may be coming here, right? Right. You've been doing well? Yes, we have. Well, uh, when you went to Okinawa on your flight, we did meet, but that was like 20 years ago already. Well, it's, it looks like your talk might keep going. going. Well, you didn't uh, uh, fly with the royal family on plane. You must have been nervous. You did. You said you didn't, but was it really? Well, a flight wouldn't be any different from other times. Well, you're still a cool guy. Well, sorry. Well, really, thank you very much for coming and. I have uh, dark hair, but I uh, I'm dyed, and uh, you've turned gray. But we'll continue to work hard, right? We will. Thank you very much. Now, yet another uh, speaker on the video is uh, uh, Dr. Joy M. Sorosa. Uh, she is the president of the Davao del Norte uh, State College. She graduated, she completed the uh, life uh, environment science uh, research uh, section in 2005. She has her doctor's degree and uh, uh, alumni. She's there. And uh, also our uh, graduate school have uh, the program economic public policy program and We have uh, uh, Dr. Astergomena Tax, who is currently the Minister of Defense and National Service in Tanzania, and she had her doctor's degree. We also have students of economics and public policy program. From Malawi, Central Bank, Reserve Bank of Malawi, Crispin Kamui Kenny is here. Hi, what are you studying at the University of Tsukuba? Hello. Hello. I am pursuing a master's program in economic and public policy under the international public policy degree programs. Oh, I see. That is at the bent of your career. Back in my country, Malawi, I work as an economist uh, for the Reserve Bank of Malawi, the country's central bank. And uh, uh, one of the uh, job requirements in the department is to carry out complex economic analysis and conduct research. And to do this, one has to be skilled, possess intellectual uh, curiosity, and be able to continue learning. And those are precisely the adventures of my career. Is your research and student life at the University of Tsukuba used for your adventure? Absolutely, yes. The program emphasizes developing skills to carry out uh, independent, credible, and practical research. And uh, uh, there are so many programs, research programs, like uh, we are given so many assignments on research, and those have indeed uh, helped my understanding and my analytical skills towards other people's work. And also, there, there is a requirement for us to 
do the student research progress seminar often, and indeed this has been helpful in improving my uh, ability to communicate ideas. And finally, there are also so many research seminars by invited guests, and these have exposed me to a fascinating world of research, and I love it. I just love it. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. We also have international students from China. She majors in life and earth science, Ms. Tao Na. Hello. Hello, everyone. What do you study at University of Tsukuba? Okay, ma'am. Uh, this is. I'm, I'm from the class of uh, 21, 21st, and this is my third year as a PhD student here. And my major is uh, agricultural sciences, major in the combi combination of microbiology and, chemi and chemistry. Thank you. So what is the adventure factor in your career? A lot about our like really nice sharing of stories about the adventure. Like to me, of course, the first thing coming here to Japan, studying here in Scuba, of course, is my <laughs> biggest uh, adventure here. And then, of course, I also ask myself, I mean, as a max scholarship, uh, I, I got the max scholarship. I want to want, I also want to like do something. I want to be helpful for the world. I want to do something for human health and environment protection. But there are so many interesting directions of which how should I do? What am I supposed to do? So I, I hesitated a lot until I my, met my sensei, Kitamala sensei and Kokawa sensei. Like with this amazing discussion with them, I, I find my direction. So I think all these uh, encounters with different people and friends from all over the world in Tsukuba University, they all my adventure and my treasure. How does the research as well as campus life serve your adventure at University of Tsukuba? But I have been enjoying this uh, adventure here like really, really a lot. I feel like Tsukuba University is, is kind of like a uh, like really diverse uh, a place for every student since we come from different culture. But don't worry because our school is really open and uh, it's very international. So all these courses all these classes, teaching, environment, everything, you can have enough freedom to continue, to continue your research here. You can shine your own value. So what I want to say, just reaching out more people, um, open more minded with your uh, sensei, with your classmates, with your lab mates, and, and join as much as seminar you can. And um, thanks to Tsukuba University, offer me a lot of international chance, international conference, uh, joinment. Mm, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. University of Tsukuba is also normalizing its internationalism on campus. We have a great number of international students and researchers on campus at the same time sending out many of our students and researchers abroad. Our Students and alumni are on the front line across the world. 1991, someone graduated from the Second School of Comparative Cultural Studies and now serving as the JICA officer in charge of procurement and dispatch. Ms. Kanako Adachi is with us, and her talking talk partner is Professor Mari Minowa of University of Tsukuba. Amano-san, will you introduce them? Thank you. Ms. Adachi, as has been touched upon by Ms. Aoyama, is currently serving at JICA, which is an agency that centrally implements Japanese ODA. JICA's project is squarely embracing the lives of local people. And her major was the same, Adachi-san's major was the same as mine. 
mine, but she has been versed in biodiversity preservation and forest preservation project planning and evaluation in Africa and Middle East. Though she is a person from humanity background, she also has quite an aptitude in non-humanities area as well. Now, Professor Minowa graduated from the University of Tokyo and entered the graduate school in area studies. Having acquired PhD from University of Cornell, she worked for World Bank Institute, being the economist in charge of social development of in Latin America and Caribbean countries. She also has come back to University of Tsukuba to teach developmental economy, economy, public policies, and JICA's uh, aiding grant programs have also been the areas of her specialties. Now, floor is goes to the two ladies. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Adachi-san, it is very nice to see you this afternoon. We only have limited time, so we, the, without further ado, I would like to start asking you questions. As has been introduced, I myself have worked for international organization on the front line of development for about 10 years before coming back to campus. So I've been looking for this opportunity myself. Thank you very much to be given opportunities. So you are from the comparative culture analysis. So tell me why you got interested in working for JICA. I majored in college. I was studying Asian area studies in the College of Comparative Culture. My focus was why are there variations in terms of the development among countries in the world with similar aid programs or with similar policies? There are succeeding countries like Malaysia, and there are other countries that cannot succeed. So that was one of the points of interest that I have had. Back then, I thought government policy can have a strong influence on the outcomes, say, a policy led by the government will be rolled out for the achievement or the development of the country. And other countries may roll out policies for the vested interest of people in a prestigious positions. That may lead to different outcomes. And with these understanding, I thought that JICA can be a great place for me to explore all the possibilities to close the gap. The sense of issue is very similar to the one I have had, even though I am now in the area of academia. One of the key word of this interview or the theme of this interview is adventure. So what makes an adventure? Studying on Scuba University of Scuba campus is an adventure in and of itself, many people have said. Maybe that was true for yourself as well. On the front line of international development, I believe that that is another dimension of adventure as well. So tell me about it. As you have rightly pointed out, coming to the campus of University of Tsukuba is in and of itself an adventure because it was my first time being away from my family. I also have an opportunity to study in the U.S. after my graduate education, and that was another ad adventure. So all those accumulation of adventurous episodes have allowed me to open the door at J JICA. When I was having a job interview, I still remember the question I received. Can you go to Africa alone? Can you be stationed in Africa alone? That was the question I asked. I studied in the U.S., but I really haven't been to developing world. And then going to Africa alone, and that was a question. I just couldn't think of what would happen to me if I was made to be stationed. And I was then told that there are other female predecessors who have been there. And if there is another person who can do that, I thought that I can. So I, the answer was yes, and that has opened the door for me. And I, ever since I joined JICA, I went to Africa, Middle East, or Latin America, and many other countries. It's very different from Japan. So I made lots of mistakes. For example, I just 
have to be absent from a very important meeting because I drank bad water and having some health issues. And there are very weak signals. And I had a flat tire on my way to the dam deep in the mountain, but the spare tire on the car didn't fit the car at all. So these were all those interesting episodes of adventures I have had. But even from failures, there are lots of things that you can learn from. Maybe you can learn even more things from a failure than from a success. So an environment that allows an adventure is quite wonderful. Thank you. You see, I had intestinal issues as well, and I always toted along the medication to stop diarrhea, uh, having discussions with the discussion partners, for example. So you've been a global trotter for years, but as it's been introduced, you majored, in, you were in a college of comparative culture, and then you are now into biodiversity preservation or forest preservation. That demands aptitude in science as well. So you, even though Japan tends to divide humanities and sciences, but what do you think about those interdisciplinary studies that you have had? When I was, up until I was assigned to a forest preservation or environment, I was a novice because I was fully humanities person. JICA provides aid to countries around the world in many different areas. Therefore, there are lots of different divisions and there are lots of international branches across dozens of countries and there are a great number of affiliated organizations across the country as well. And you get rotated among different divisions every two to three years. And into my 10th year at JICA, I was assigned to the division in charge of afforestation. But forest preservation isn't really about the trees. You look at the lives of people living in there. And then the question is how to achieve the preservation of forests and preservation of people's livelihood at the same time. And then I thought that if it is really a people job, I thought that I can do that and winning the budgets from the government, communicating and organizing and coordinating. And that I think is where I thought I can find my possibilities. And by and by I studied about the forest as well. I don't want to talk too much about myself, but myself, I have an engineering or science background and I'm now teaching in the humanities section. So I know how it feels like transcending the order between different disciplines, meeting new people with different backgrounds and areas of specialties. That I think is a very adventurous journey as well. That is quite exciting. And uh, it seems that we are left with very little time. So two more things I would make. Other than what you have told me, when you were studying at University of Tsukuba and experiencing things on campus, what have these contributed to your current career? Can you share it with me? University of Tsukuba. In addition to the areas of specialties, you, I have been able to acquire a wider perspective or multidimensional perspective because it was quite liberal and I have had lots of opportunities to take classes from different disciplines, such as international relations. But even in the same area of international relations, different professors often had conflicting viewpoints, but world is not a place where there is only one answer. One phenomena can be seen in a very different manner from different perspectives. So what you're seeing may be different from what other people are seeing. So multidimensional perspective is something that I have acquired on this campus, and that has been quite useful at JICA because I need to work with countries and people with very different history and culture. Thank you. 
Now, this is going to be my very last question. Going forward, visiting uh, for students who will be going abroad or going global, do you have any piece of advice for such students? International, at the front line of the world, may want you make you think that you need to study something about other countries. Of course, that is important. But for Japanese people who go abroad, they often get questions, well, how do you do this in Japan? And then I often get an inquiry as to the way we do business in Japan as well. So Japanese students for international career, please do study about Japan. And for international students on campus, you are already functioning as a bridge connecting two cultures and languages. That can also give you a great qualification for you to thrive on an international stage. So please take a look at Japan closely and use it as an axis of knowledge for your future career going forward. Thank you very much. University of Tsukuba attach importance to interdisciplinarity and internationalism. And I believe that Adachi-san is a testament to the value of U of Scuba University. Though time was limited, it was quite enjoyable talking to you. My best of luck goes to your future success. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Adachi and Dr. Minowa. So today we had a lot in our program. We have spoken to people from many different fields. So to the University of Tsukuba, over just 50 years, I believe it has produced very unique talents who are quite active out there in the world. Um, everybody uh, seems to have the willingness to take up challenges. Now today, uh, Amano-san, Oguri-san, um, you both helped us facilitate these sessions. So what will be your next adventure? So, Amano-san, well, yes, uh, there are things that I would like to try, and I would like to take up the challenge. I won't. I don't want to hesitate. Uh, from around the world and from all kinds of fields, I was able to hear from many people. So I think being curious and always trying to take up the challenge is very important. So I'd like to follow in all my predecessors' footsteps. And by on the other hand, of course, there are many things that I alone will not be able to achieve. After I entered university, um, we went through COVID and there was a lot of hardship, but I was able to meet many people and I was supported by many people and that's why I'm here today. So over the four years, uh, links with people um, has become a precious asset for myself. So I will continue to seek links and connections with others and I would like to take up my adventure um, throughout my life by being I'm thankful to all the connections that I've achieved. Oguri-san, what about you? So I was able to hear from many uh, former students of our university. I understand that it's not just the specialty areas that we need to study, but uh, we need to learn about many different things. I am in the fourth grade of the university now, and after I graduate, I am going to uh, move on to the graduate school and I will be studying um, a very niche um, area, but I would like to keep my antenna high and try to capture a lot of information as I pursue my studies. Thank you very much for this opportunity today. Thank you too. And we wish you luck. So people coming to the University of Tsukuba, um, for the young people, I believe it is an adventure of sorts. But that frontier spirit, because you have that, I believe you are able to take up the challenge of facing your new adventures. And I do hope that I can meet you again um, in the future. And, and we need to also make efforts as well. 
Now, the University of Tsukuba tomorrow will mark its 50th anniversary, and since its opening, Tsukuba has always continued to reform and take up challenges, and it was a frontier towards the future. And the slogan was, Imagine the Future. For the next 50 years, the slogan for the university would be, Design the Future Together. So, going beyond national borders, borders that divide industry, government, academia, and going beyond different disciplines, and uh, the university will continue to deepen engagement with society to contribute to the creation of f the future. And the university will continue to take up challenges to contribute to society and continue to produce excellent research results for the world and provide education based on that. So I do hope that all of you will continue to cheer on and root for the adventure that the university will uh, take on towards the future. And with this, we would like to end this session where we looked at the adventures and the design and their design of the future.